Hello and welcome and today is going to be a good day because it's round four of the women's candidates in Toronto. I'm your host, International Master Yvonne Kahowska, and it's a great pleasure to be commenting all the action alongside the one, the only, Robert Haas. Robert, welcome to the show and have you been following the action? Oh, I've been following all the action very closely. As soon as my coverage of the candidates was done, I would go and immediately look at the games. And if I'm going to be honest, even during some of the breaks, I would go and sneak a peek over at these women's candidates games. They, they've been fierce. Uh, there have been some great clashes between some awesome players. And I'm really stoked to come to it with you today, Ivanka. Yeah, the feeling is mutual. And uh, yeah, you kind of called it. The action has been scintillating. The players have come to the games in a spirited mood, but you can see there is one sole leader for the time being. Still early days, just round three, but Tang Zhongyi already showing she is in good shape with two and a half points out of three. With two points behind, there is Alexandra Goreshkina and with one and a half points, Humpy Canary, Katerina Lagno, and Bay Charlie. So everything still to play for. Robert, have you been surprised by Tan's success? You know what's funny about her games? I think most people, they would highlight her wins, but I might have even been most impressed by her draw yesterday. She had more time than she started with. Stellar preparation. So for a Tan Zhang Yi, I mean, her second, her team, they're working very hard behind the scenes and her play at the board has been phenomenal. So I'm not surprised because she's such a great player, but I think that she's shown that she's firing at all cylinders. Yeah, she certainly has. And yeah, you called it yesterday. She was in business mode. Today, it's round four. So let's take a look at those pairings. And now it is Katarina Legno who will be playing against Tan Zhong Yi. And Sally Mova takes on Humpy Kanori. Alexandra Greshkina plays Vaishali and Anna Muzichuk against Lei Tingjie. So Robert, which one of those matches excite you the most? Well, I'm sure we will have our attention closely on the game between Katarina Lakno and Tan Zhang Yi, but I'm going to actually note the zeros on our screen. Many of these players have not defeated their opponents in classical chess. In order to win the candidates, you have to rack up those points. So expect that to change. I do think we will have some decisive games. But of course, our leader, Tan Zhang Yi, she wants to do as she did yesterday, play solidly because Katarina Lakno. Yvanka, that's a lifetime plus for her. Two games ahead is Lagno. Yes, she is. And uh, Robert is predicting some decisive games. But today, you can also make some decisions because you can win prizes by voting on who will win before every round by going to each game on the FIDE candidates and FIDE women's candidates event pages. Find the social tab and pick your winner. Go.chess.com slash candidates votes. You only have a couple of minutes before the games start. So get voting for the chance to win big. <laughs> well, Ivanka, <laughs> I think the winners are all the fans because they get to witness these awesome players duke it out in this all-important tournament. And as we see Anna Musichuk and Lei Tingji on screen, it's hard to pick a game, Ivanka. Every game truly is a battle between giants. It certainly is. And uh, there you did see Anna Muzichuk looking determined. And here, this is an encounter I'm eagerly anticipating. Alexandra against Vaishali. Now, Vaishali scored a very much needed comeback win after her loss in round two to Tan Zhong Yi. Goreshkina, she did win her game against Anna Muzichuk in round two. So these two players, they are the, well, they're not the leaders because Alexandra Goreshkina is in second place. But I can't wait to see what type of active game the players will be choosing. Goreshkina already. I'm not sure. Would it be E4? Would it be D4? She can play anything. <laughs> I'm not sure. She even knows. She'll probably decide at the board here. In all seriousness, working hard uh, with all these players with their seconds. And we see uh, Nurgil Salimova take the white piece against Humpy Koneru. And we see the handshakes, Yvanka. So we're off. I don't know what first moves we'll see. I don't know either. And uh, here we do see Tan Zhong Yi, tournament leader. And uh, this is also a question I was asking myself today. How will Tan Zhong Yi respond to Katerina Lagno's first move? I wasn't sure whether it's going to be Sicilian. I thought it might be, but it might also have been E4, E5. And there you can see it is a Sicilian on the board. 
are you at all surprised by this? Because oftentimes when we see players, when they just really quickly sprint out to a lead in the tournament, they try to take it easy. They play safer chess, but we might get a night orf here. So Yvonka, does that shock you at all from the tournament leader after three rounds? And um, no, because I'm <laughs> just looking at through Tan's games, I can see she plays absolutely everything and she tends to choose very active choices against Lagno. She's played the dragon before. She's also played the four knights, classical Sicilian, but she's also played E4, E5 and dynamic versions of that. But here we're going into an open Sicilian. And this is my, one of my favorite moments. We get to see the opponent, well, the player's preparation. Yes, and they better prepare deeply when you're entering the treacherous waters of potentially a Night Orf if A6, and I believe she just played the move A6. Because, Yvanka, one of the storylines that have been behind the scenes, but then the seconds appear in person, is a who you're working with. We know that in the candidates, for example, Pierce Fiddler, uh, everybody loves him. He's on scene working with Pragananda and Katarina Lakno. I mean, her seconds have been there. She also is married to a very strong player in Alexander Grishuk. Uh, Tan Zhang Yi has Jeffrey Zhang working with her, and he's known to trot out a good Sicilian or two. So sometimes players, they may have openings that are uh, as diverse as any, but then their seconds may lead them to a certain to a certain path. So I don't know who to give credit to. Usually the players are the ones making the ultimate choice. But to choose a sharp opening against Katarina Lucknow, who is a positive lifetime score against Tan Zhang Yi, she's saying, I'm not afraid of you. I'm ready for this battle. Absolutely. And uh, on the subject of Katarina's second, we do know that she's working with uh, Alexander. No, what's his name? That's not his name. Isipenko. <laughs> Andre. <laughs> Andre. Andre Isipenko. <laughs> I'm so used to say Alexandra that I ended up saying. Yeah, when I should say Andre Isipenko, <laughs> E5 on the board. And I'm expecting something very combative from the two. Katarina does not look phased whatsoever. And why should she? Because if we talk about some of the specifics here, it's a standard knight or if white is going to try to take advantage of this D5 square, no black pawn can help cover it. And I think many newer players who may even be watching this broadcast, they are used to hearing about weak pieces that you pile up pressure on. But at these high levels, it's not just about winning a pawn or pinning a piece to win material. It's about trying to take advantage of loose squares. And in black's camp, it is this D5 square that white is going after but black of course has this knight on f6 can always bring a bishop to e6 to cover and if black ever pushes that deep on then things seem to clear up so uh, at the opening stage here yavanka we've seen this many many times before both players as well uh, but the players in this particular game they're moving pretty much instantly it's clear that they're well within their preparation yes they are in their preparation but uh we are going to see a battle in this game and that's what i love to see so we go to the bird's eye view and check in on the other three games because checking it out i can see that some people are in a fighting mood now the where i'm looking at is the game between uh, salimova against humpy canary so salimova has employed a catalan it's there in the top right in green. I love the, the fact that the boards are all, all have their different colors. That caught my eye. I was gonna say, I'm a fan of the color. Sorry to interject there, but I'm no artist myself, but the different uh, color palette is definitely pleasing. And so what about this caught your eye? I'm guessing that there's a black knight on E4 that wasn't provoked to the square. Yes, because, okay, this knight move doesn't necessarily look that impressive, but it, I have seen Vaishali play a very similar system, and she backed it up with the moves f5 and g5. So we could potentially see a kingside pawn stop. Now, this might be typical for Vaishali. She's known for her enterprising, active play. I wonder whether Humpy is going to follow in her footsteps. I would be a little bit surprised just because Humpy is such a classically trained player. We typically see her win really instructive, <laughs> beautiful positions where her opponent has an isolated pawn and she punishes them. Oh, you called it though, Humpy. She is all in on the aggressive play. So my question for you, Yvanka, it's the last round before the first rest day. The players get the day off tomorrow. Do you think she feels like now is the time to strike, especially against the lowest rated player in the field, who also lost her previous game. 
Yes, I th I think this is the moment to strike because ultimately Salimova is the one with a target on her back. She is less than 100 points rated behind these girls and Humpy will want to win. She did mention that she'd worked really hard for this event and she's drawn three, three of her games. I think she mentioned that she was also slightly disappointed with her results. She expected to score better from her positions. So why not put your opponent, your lower rated opponent under pressure with F5? Now, this is a really risky move because it does concede control over the E5 square. And that's something that Humpy might have to worry about at a later stage. She'll also have to factor in the potential of Salimova, perhaps just retreating for a few moves and then trying to break open into the center with moves like F3 and E4 and exploding open the position. But I am really excited to see how this game will continue. Salimova, she's been working, you mentioned seconds, she's been working with Cheparinov and Gokachan. So I'm really fascinated whether she will have considered this setup, or whether she has a response. One of the big struggles for Salimova yesterday, and Ivanka, thank you so much for filling me in before this broadcast because I've seen the games, but I asked you this question. What was it like during the games? How did you feel tensions were arising? And one of the problems for Salimova that I didn't notice when I was quickly scrolling through the game is that she got herself into early time trouble and she wasn't able to find the accurate continuations when the position became tactical against Vaishali, which was pretty quickly in that game. But here she's you know, done well thus far, played quick moves, but if she's unfamiliar with the position and if she anticipates G5, she may be thinking, am I already going to get in some trouble? How is the best way to play? Because you mentioned this E5 square. I would like to play Bishop to F4, but I might just walk in to this G5 pawn push and then Black storms forward. So do you think that yesterday's result is playing on her mind at all for Salimova? Um, it's, it's difficult to say because Salimova just kind of exploded onto the scene around about 2021. So she's kind of relative newcomer. So I, we haven't really got a gauge on how she's able to handle those setbacks, but she has shown to be resilient here. So B3 played relatively quickly as well. That's a nice idea, perhaps with the idea of going Bishop to A3. I, that is the question, though, when it comes to her mindset in this particular event, whether she's going to be able to recover from yesterday's uh, yesterday's game. And I would also say that there was a flaw also shown in her play yesterday, that she, she perhaps let the tension and her nerves cloud her calculation ability because she didn't defend in the best way possible against Beishali. But we know she's such a phenomenal player and that when she's in form she can do things like make a late run in the world cup which is how she earned her ticket to this very event so uh, nobody is counting Salimova out but if we are being honest these players know that every point matters and sometimes you have to pick somebody to try and win against from the black side and it looks like from humpy's opening that she is willing to take some humongous strategic risks one of which is that e5 square so Ivanka, that's why i love that you mentioned that bishop a3 move because in many of these positions maybe even in this one you trade off the dark square bishops so you can get better control of that loose e5 square when your pawns two squares apart everybody look at the square in between and that's exactly what Ivanka is advocating for so bishop a3 might be early now but i love that you're putting that on our radar yep and uh, it is a common technique when you do have an outpost for your knight to just exchange away the defenders of that square, the bishop and the knight. So that's going to be really interesting uh, a battle, I feel. Shall we go back to the bird's eye view and have a look at the two remaining games? Okay, and I'm looking at the bottom right, and I have to admit, Ivanka, the game between Anna Muzichuk and Lei Tingji, thus far in exchange French, you can't count me as the most excited person about that. So uh, as you look at the bottom right there, are you a bit surprised? Because I don't think we see the French defense at this high level that often. Yes, and I did notice that there was a pause. So if we go to, if we check out that game, because Lei Ting Jie, I, I mean, she can play anything, but I don't recall her being a French defense player. 
No, and I think we can rewind just to show how this game started because it was King's Pawn. And then after E6, this is what you were referring to, Yvanka. Uh, Anna sat and thought because she wildly was not expecting the French. So before making the move D4, it wasn't automatic. She spent a little bit of time. So surprise by Le Tingji on move one. Yeah, and Le Tingji has been uh, launching the surprise yesterday. <laughs> I love that she played the Evans Gambit, an old romantic opening uh, <laughs> against uh, Gori Ashkina. I, I thought that was gutsy and a, a good decision. And it just goes to show that she's actually using psychological psychological pressure to make the opponents burn time on the clock. But um, it's interesting that Anna has responded with E takes D5 because Anna tends to respond very aggressively against the French. I've seen her play knight to d2, knight to c3. So to suddenly move away from that and just go e takes d5, which even though the structure is symmetrical, is not so easy because white does have the benefit of making the first move. It's such a critical point because sometimes we're dismissive of this opening and saying, that's symmetry, everyone's doing the same thing. Knight of three, knight of six, right? Copycat. Yeah. Bishop d3. Bishop d6. Castles, guess what? Castle. So the players are copying each other, but as you said, white has that first tempo, and bishop g5 is a good illustration of that point. You can pin the opponent's knight first, and no longer can black just play copycat chess. So there we see the first non-copying move of the game in rook to e8. That makes perfect sense to me, Ivanka, going for the open file. And I guess my question for you is, and at this point... Muzichuk, she has a minus score in the tournament. She lost that game in round two. She would love to get a win before the rest day to even up her record. This doesn't seem like the dream opening, even if her position is totally fine, even though you can play for a little something. I don't think anyone really wants to play the white side of the exchange French, especially when it came as a surprise. Yeah, um, this is where I feel like you have to be quite holistic about playing chess. You have to just play what's on the board. I know it's very tempting to kind of impose your personality. You're an aggressive player, so you want to play something sharp. But uh, I think actually I'm going to disagree with you. I think it's a good choice to play the exchange because Leiting J, she's very active and she favors dynamism. And if she's just uh, prepared the French defense, then I'm suspecting she's dedicated a lot of her energy towards those critical lines, like the advance, like the winner word, like the Tarish putting the knight out to d2 or knight to c3. And maybe not the exchange. Maybe she just knows a few things here and there. Like, for instance, I've already noticed one thing that French defense players, they tend to like some asymmetry. So if white puts the knight on f3, the French defense players will tend to put their knight on e7 just to have some little imbalance and then they can get their light square bishop out. But Lei, she's just kind of copied. And there's already an issue here with this light square bishop that Lei has. It's sitting there on c8, only has one square available, which is the square on g4. And here, Anna could just go h3. And then the issue is, well, where's it going to go then? So there are some small little imbalances, but I mean, you're right. It's going to hinge on this light square bishop, but also like very small nuances, like who controls the E line, who's able to get those good squares for the pieces. And yeah, it's, it's going to be a very interesting fight ahead, I think. Your point is very well taken, though, so I appreciate you uh, disagreeing with me, gently, of course, but I I'm with you because it is a stylistic choice, and some players, even if the evaluation bar says it's all even, you can make six different moves, they struggle in maneuvering positions versus tactical ones. So I do actually completely agree with you there, and I I'm not going to take... In the entirety of my words back, but I am going to acknowledge your point for sure. And I, I think it's a good one that if Anna can get this small plus, try to play in the center, uh, she, for example, can play knight c3 here, going right after the d5 pawn. Instead, she goes knight d2. I was going to say that would force c6, and finally, we won't have all of our pieces on the same squares. Instead, she chooses knight to d2, likely putting her pawn on c3 and creating a pawn chain towards the center. So I, I have to say, Ivanka, it's not the most interesting game just yet because there's no tension between the pieces, but it's a game where they're going to build up and we'll see which of these two players is ready for a fight if there will indeed be one. Yep, I completely agree there. 
we will see. So let's go back to the bird's eye view and uh, have a look at our final outstanding game. And that is between, um, here we have Vaishali, <laughs> Gretchkina against Vaishali. Now that game, I am so eagerly anticipating. Vaishali has such a combative style. It's heavily based on calculation. Gretchkina is a little bit more positional, but has been trying to round out her style by adopting more aggressive openings. So what do we have here? I think we have a great illustration of the point you just made in the previous game, a stylistic clash and a stylistic decision by Goryachkina, because we can start at the beginning. We are only 10 moves in, uh, but we've transformed into a position with an isolated queen pawn, and some people love playing with it. Others really love playing against it. So Ivanka will go move by move here. Now we see the knights come out. C4, C5, a little symmetrical chess. Knight C3, E6, G3. And here we see black decide to strike in the center. So none of this is new. The players know this stuff. But I really do believe, Ivanka, that as we see the move D4 played, that this was the entirety of Goryashkina's plan. She wanted to saddle her opponent with a potential long-term weakness. And to your point, Ivanka, Vaishali, she likes active play, which you typically get around that isolated pawn. Yeah, and uh, moving forward on, I, uh, I'm kind of curious about this position because it reminds me of variations in my Karakhan, but this time with the white pieces and with the extra tempo, as we say. Knight to a4. And we just got an exchange on d4 after knight a4. So just to... Uh, uh, note that the bishop on b6 was under attack, which is why Vaishali took. And now we get this position where black is ahead in development. But Ivanka, I'm going to ask you a zoom out question for a second. Do you prefer playing with the isolated pawn or against it? I like to play against it. I'm all about those uh, long-term trumps. <laughs> but on the other hand, I, when I'm physically playing against the isolated queen's pawn, I feel a level of discomfort <laughs> that sometimes I think, hmm... Maybe I should uh, take it up from the white side or the side with the isolated queen's pawn or the side with more activity. Because one of the things that you really do have to bring your tactical A-level game when you're facing this, uh, this isolated queen's pawn, because take a look at this position that we have here. Black's knights can get ready to hop into e4. There can also be some trades. There's some also open lines, the e line, the c line, strong squares for a knight. For instance, the knight on c6 can jump to c4. And this can be very unpleasant. There's also this bishop springing out to g4. I mean, there's so many possibilities is what I want to get at with the pieces that you have to be considerate of every single one of them. And this is quite, quite difficult. And for me, I often struggle with my time usage in these type of positions. I back everything you just said completely and i think that i also prefer playing against the what we call the iqp the isolated queen spawn but i also struggle with those night jumps with the open files around it and then i don't know when to cash in because at any moment it would seem white can take on f6 and you know even now i actually think we should maybe show what happens after bishop takes f6 because this d5 pawn is done for but after bishop takes f6 Black takes back with the queen, of course. And if you get greedy and maybe take this pawn with your queen on d5, we see that black is so far ahead in development. And I'm not even sure what the best way forward is, but bishop g4, to my eyes, Ivanka, looks like a very simple move, bringing our rook to d8 next. And yeah. a white king in the center is not well positioned. Yeah, I was also liking knight to d4, if that works. Oof, just go right for this pawn, threaten knight to c2. Yeah. Still says black has an advantage, not quite as big as some other moves, apparently. But OK, yeah. this is a slight advantage for black. White has done something very wrong. Totally, totally, totally. But I agree with you. It just goes to show, you know, the position can uh, liven up and explode into fireworks at any occasion. And they're very complex positions. So rook to e8 played a tempo. And again, looking at the clock times, very Charlie, which is on the same time that she started with, whereas Koreshkina that is the one burning that time on her clock. So I'm not expecting, I was gonna say, I'm not expecting the bishop takes knight, but yet there we see knight to c3 being played. 
I like that move. Knights on the rim are considered dim. This knight puts pressure on that isolated pawn. Also protects this e2 pawn in case black had any ideas against it. So I think that was a good choice. And one of the big questions, Yvonka, and I'm going to need your help, is I don't think black wants to take this bishop on d4 and allow the white queen to blockade that isolated pawn. But I always struggle with when is it okay to take it and when is it just objectively bad? Yeah, uh, that is also the issue that I struggle with as well. Too many choices. And you don't also have to just worry about knight takes bishop. You also have to think about like the other knight jumping into the middle of the board as well. Is, is that viable? Is black simply going to develop the light square bishops and put pressure on e2? Very complicated. And uh, we have a move from Vaishali again. At tempo, she answers the question for us. It's all about developing the bishop to f5. And even this is like you have to consider what black wants. Is, is it to do with just jumping in with your knight to e4? Or is the idea just to step up with the queen, connect the rooks? I love this type of moves. No, you can't do that because the knight. Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> calculation <laughs> rule 101 <laughs> checks <laughs> captures, yeah, and threats yeah but okay so, so the, the plan is going to be just to put a knight onto e4 then and i think it's just in time because if the white king safely castles then we're really thinking about bishop takes knight removing the guard of this loose pawn on d5 so as soon as white castles now you have your antennas up and i think that castle will be met by your move knight to e4 it's perfectly time for black you have your bishop, you have your rook, you also have this d5 pawn all defending the square. So trades, uh, liquidation, that often helps uh, in positions like this, as long as you don't trade too much. Because if we take off all the pieces, Yvonka, I think that's how I tend to consider these positions. Black is in some danger with this isolated pawn, a king and pawn endgame. You don't want to have a pawn all by itself uh, that's very far down the line, but something to consider well in advance. It certainly is something to consider. And Vaishali, well within her preparation. So now that all the players have emerged from the opening stage, I think it's the perfect time for us to head into a very short break. But do remember that tomorrow it is a rest day. The players will be taking a rest day, but the grind never stops for that. Get your daily dose of chess in the Community Candidates Arenas, held every rest day starting tomorrow. Join the Community Club and enter the arena where we're grifting, oh, sorry, not grifting, we're gifting <laughs> diamond membership to top finishers and random participants. Use Exclam Arena in chat to get in on the action. And with that, we'll see you in a few more minutes. Do you know about Nobel Prizes? No. Over 50 members of the Athenaeum have won Nobel Prizes. Bertram Russell, Winston Churchill. Rudyard Kipling, have you heard of? Uh, you're too young, you don't know all these people. Tactically, I'm quite, I'm still quite strong. I can still, re you give me a position in the paper white to play and win the first move I think of is usually the answer. Um, I think I'm quite good at the Rookin games, but I'm not sure about my weakness. This is the, mo I think, the most expensive breed library in the world after the British Museum. Oh. This is the Darwin chair. Have you heard of Charles Darwin? Darwin chair. Yeah. They play between each other chess. Can I go up the stairs or am I not allowed? Yes. Do you want to go up the stairs? I've never been up the stairs. Let's go up the stairs. This is high. What's this thing over here? Okay. It's an old thing for parcel posts. So if you have to send a parcel, you weigh, you put the parcel in one and you put the weights in the other. And when it balances, you know the parcel weighs four pounds or um, so many grams. I think the optimal age for playing my first chess would probably be when I'm somewhere around a teenager. Mid thirties is probably the be the people reach their reach their strongest, and um, so at age seventy nine, I'm probably a bit past it. <laughs> 
We are back with the coverage of round four of the women's candidates. The players have navigated the opening stage. There have been some opening surprises already. And the players, they have come to the board in a very spirited mood already. And how have you, how have you thought about these openings, Robert? Have you been surprised at all? I certainly have. I think that the players, they're showing that uh, they have diverse repertoires. They're willing to venture into new territory. And you can see from the four different positions we have on the screen, we're not just getting repetitive lines in each game. These are four completely different positions, whether you're looking in the top left or the bottom right. So Ivanka, I'm going to pass this on over to you because all the games uh, are so lively. Which one is catching your eye the most at the moment? It's the one between Salimova and Humpy Canaru there on the top right in green. Now, the reason I'm really drawn to this game is because Humpy is not playing to her usual classical style. And she just took a very committal decision because with her last move, she's actually forfeited castling rights. Well, for the time being, at least. Because if this bishop stands on a3, the king cannot travel through that square in order to castle. So that indicates to me that Humpy's plan is to put pressure on d4. And, you know, I mentioned that at kingside expansion. I think that's in the works. This is such a big moment for both Salimova and Humpy. And I think you're entirely right that this is preparation from Humpy. You do not make a move like bishop to f6 
removing your right to castle for the time being, unless you've studied this position and you understand it very well. But there is a huge problem with this pawn on d4. And if we can just analyze a move or two, I am curious, Ivanka, you said that Humpy, she wants to go for it on the king side. If white plays maybe the most natural move, e3, to defend this pawn on uh, d4, my question for you is, how are you going to attack the white king side? That, that, is a, that is a very, very good question. And I'm not really sure of the answer because Humpy is breaking the rules here. You know, she is putting her knight very early on in e4. That's kind of not the done thing. She's conceded the e5 square and she's also lost her castling rights for the time being, as I mentioned. And her knight is there on c6. Usually it's in front of his own pawns, you know, which does mean that in a middle game, if Humpy hasn't achieved anything, then this knight is going to be standing in front of his own pawns and there's a very clear cut plan for Salimova. She can either utilize the opening of the C line or she can just simply advance on the queen side as much as possible. So Humpy has to do something. And the only thing that I can think of is just she goes for it. G5. Mm -hmm. H, G, you know, G5, G4, H5, H4, come on. <laughs> allez, 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 as the French like to say, because it doesn't really make too much sense. I mean, how else is she going to be playing? Is she going to be castling by hand, as we like to say, with king to f7 and then moving the rook? But then this feels odd, to say the least. There's also, I guess, the question as well, whether Humpy can go e5 herself. Ooh, but again, I would not even touch that because that would be breaking the playbook another time. Because <laughs> 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 we're often taught not to just accelerate the play when the king is in the middle of the board. So I, I'm going for G5. I, 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 I saw like Charlie it. do something similar. And I'm going to go for G5, G4, seize the space on the king's side, and then let's get going maybe then go e5 you know why i like this so much and there is one point in particular that you mentioned uh, black has moved two different pieces twice this knight hopped from f6 into e4 this bishop went to e7 to f6 so you're spending all of this time with your pieces and the reason why she can get away with it is because the center is close so e5 is such a good idea but as you very quickly pointed out you're like not yet that's a you know a pipe dream but to open up the bishop to this rook in the corner but keeping the center closed going for it i like g5 i like h5 go alpha zero style throw your pawns all the way up the board here and go for the attack so this is i think the idea i don't know if h5 or g5 i'm just put one of them on the board yeah look the bar didn't change so our ideas are spot on here in fact if you try to stop this pawn push you're allowing the second one to really rip open the king side yvanka this is I mean, completely unplayable from the white side yeah totally unplayable to do that but then it begs the question that if h5 happens what is white's plan because white hasn't done anything wrong <laughs> but yet black is playing in this audacious way so how to handle this i'm shaking my head Yvanga, because i don't know if you make a logical move a quiet move some kind of queen e2 then doesn't black just keep pushing you're not stopping right black from going forward and it's not checkmate right away but i don't see the plan for white black is actually quite solid in the center thanks to this knight on e4 yes i i don't see too many plans the only one that i do see is just revolving around this knight on e4 which is it, would, it bothers you know if i were playing white it would bother me no end so i would be looking at ways to kind of get rid of it so i'm thinking knight d2 makes sense to me so let's say if i don't play queen e2 which is a waste of a move maybe knight to d2 right away try to get rid of this knight but i do you even want to take it is the big question because then black gets another pawn advancing towards the white king very difficult well, choices but Yvanka, i saw the last move played e3 i'm so curious as we uh, return to the live board just for a second here, do you think that Humpy is going to throw these pawns forward right now? Because this will show her true intentions. <laughs> She's gone all in already, hasn't she? Let's face it. <laughs> I think the time has, uh, has gone for her not to go all in with the pushing those pawns because if Humpy doesn't do that, 
what else is she doing? And, and I'm a complete loss to even come up with an alternative idea. I'm with you. I mean, King F7, as you said, it's uh, castling manually, but it feels very slow and not really the point of the position. Why would you bring your bishop out to F6? She wants more pieces on the board because she wants to attack. Uh, if we see H5, uh, this is a different style that I'm used to from Humpy Conero. Uh, the position Goryachkina has against Vaishali, that's to me is humpy style, but to win an event like the Candidates here, you need to play universally. You need to be able to play a fresh opening that your opponents can't expect. And if she plays H5 right now, I see Salimova looking up. She might be in some serious trouble because you don't want to be met with an attack this early in the game. And Ivanka, it is early, as I just said, but look at the clocks. Salimova, she is down to one hour, seven minutes to many people who just play Blitz or really bullet chess. And that's a lot of time, but so many moves to make before the second time control. And with an attack brewing, I would personally be scared. It, it is scary, right? You're playing in the candidates and you know that your opponent has trained hard for it. And you know that your opponent probably has not one, but two seconds that they've been working for months on a particular idea. I would be terrified. And it's really not ideal for her because you mentioned it yesterday. She had quite a tough loss against Vaishali. The last thing you want with the white piece is just to come under fire in a way like this or to walk into your opponent's preparation. So, yeah, Salimova not looking entirely comfortable, but we see a pause there from Humpy. So I don't know why the pause. Does this mean that she's out of prep that, you know, E3 wasn't something she considered? But I'm fully expecting Humpy just to push a kingside pawn. H5, I like. I love H5 better than G5. I have to say because one of the one of the things, if we can just, if I can just quickly elaborate on one of your points about H5, is that once the pawn gets to H4, and if you trade on G3, the knight on E4 can never be kicked away because the G3 square is too soft. Yes. And one of your earlier ideas with pawn F3, it's too slow at this stage. So totally. that's another added point here and i think g5 has one other downside is that this queen does have new access to the h5 square i'm not sure how you make it work but with this knight out the way from f3 there could she okay, played it yeah what i was gonna say is yeah, that's a lesson for another time humpy is going for it and we don't root for players here but yvanka i just love the style of chess we're getting here in round four Hi, I've been loving all the styles in every round. I, I find that it's intriguing because we've seen a lot of risk taking throughout these last three rounds. We've seen players really come to the game motivated in a combative mood. And Humpy, she is switching things up. She's saying, you know what? I'm not just back. I am better than before. Look at me. I am playing hyper aggressive. Uh <laughs> I, I got that phrase from Shikari Richardson. She is such a legend. <laughs> Fantastic American sprinter. Watch, watch her yeah. race. Well, that is powerful stuff. It's, a, it's definitely a worthy quote to apply to this game. I mean, look at this. As you said, uh, it's a great shout by you that Humpy was disappointed by her own admission, by what she considered not getting the most out of her position. She's three draws. She would like a higher score as with every player on the planet, but she feels that based on the level of her play, she could have obtained more. And here she's just going for it. H5. And what I love most, Yvanka, in games like this, is she actually hasn't committed that much because the center is closed. She hasn't given up material. She hasn't created a huge weakness at least not uh, by a specific target. There may be some weak squares left behind, but who cares about squares when you're going right after your opponent's king? And you can see on Salamova, she's really deep in thought, and she will be for a while because the, the premise, H4, developing your rook on its starting square, going for an attack, that is scary. And the big point, as you mentioned, kicking this knight out of E4, not going to happen when this pawn is rumbling forward. So I really like how Humpy has played this game. Yep. Me too. And uh, well, we should take a quick pause and take a look at our bird's eye view and uh, leave Salimova to her thoughts. So where should we go to next?
maybe we can go to the game between Lagno and Tan Zhong Yi. You have to remember that uh, Tan Zhong Yi did defeat Lagno in 2022 in the women's candidates. And I was dying to ask you, Robert, do you think revenge ever plays a role <laughs> when preparing for your opponents? Well, I've, I've heard a certain player who's ranked number one in the world say revenge isn't beating someone just one time. But I do believe that the players, of course, think about that. They're human. Uh, you are taught to leave the past behind, focus on the game ahead, move by move. But yeah, when you've lost to someone in such an important match in the past, it feels sweeter uh, to get a victory against them. But in this tournament, Tan Zhang Yi has been phenomenal. Every single game she's played with purpose and that king march to win an end game in round one, uh, her win in round two against Vaishali. Yesterday, her draw where she had more time than she started with, she's been a true delight to watch. But I will say, Looking at the clocks right now, this does appear to be a relatively standard position. Tan has spent more time, and she played queen c7, so she's following up things quite nicely. I think the struggle is she has this d5 weakness for the long term, and I don't know about you, Ivanka, I've always had problems from the black side of positions like this because I feel like I want to gain more space, but I don't actually know how to crash through. Is my knight coming to c5? Is that a worthy trade? Is white going to push a pawn up to a5 at some moment when will they put a knight on d5 or push a pawn to f4 i just feel that that flexibility for white is a teeny bit more menacing and that's why i've struggled with the the black side of these positions yeah it's it's a tricky position right because black's pieces as you mentioned are pretty active but then there's no kind of clear-cut plan whereas white can just as you mentioned be flexible and one other plan i wanted to highlight which might is probably not going to be done right now but it's something you definitely always have to think about is the white bishop actually moving from e3 to g5 in order to swap itself for a defender of d5 such and a critical you, idea yeah you can you, you kind of leave this plan in your pocket but always have in the back of your mind when you see a strong square on d5 for your knight that you should be removing the defenders at some point and yeah queen to c7 perhaps with the idea of just lining up on the c line is that a plan in this type of position just to stop that knight from c3 from moving it's definitely a plan you're about but you know what's funny about that plan is you can't move your a rook i've I I made this mistake before in blitz games where i make the obvious move moving both my rooks towards the center and then i drop a pawn on a6 and i'm immediately busted so be very careful for those of you who are watching at home i know you would like to develop your rooks but this rook on a very importantly is tied to this pawn on a6 so that is another point of frustration for me yes it, it is isn't it but then if you can't line up on the C line because of the weakness on A6, does this mean that you just have to focus on the D5 square, just kind of moving the knight to C5, nice aggressive square, and then just going rook to D8 and get that breakout in the center? Looks logical. I think that's a very natural plan uh, to aim for. And you know that Tan Zhang Yi, she wants to play actively at the right moment, but she has brought a queen out to c7 first. I do like connecting the rooks, deciding whether or not to bring the knight out in a bit. And one of those other questions that white has is, do you continue pushing that does allow black to push through and maybe continue uh, on her way down to b4? So every single pawn push has its consequence, whether it's on the queen side with a5, whether it's on the king side with f4, getting aggressive, but leaving some uh, vulnerable squares, like the ones I'm highlighting over here on h4 mm -hmm. and g3 not easy to make these choices so every single move does require thought and i guess i'm gonna throw to you yavanka because i'm wondering what plans we like to see from the white side i first said that i do tend to like these positions from the white side but i also acknowledge that uh, i'm speaking out of both sides of my mouth i don't always know what plan to execute <laughs> yeah, I, I actually struggled big time when I was playing the open Sicilians with the white pieces because I didn't know how to improve my position. So the thing that really comes to mind in this type of position is to kind of keep a clamp on the um, D5 square, just stop black breaking out. So uh, you can do that by making really weird moves like bishop to F3. Um, I've seen that done, but I mean, it looks ridiculous, right? To put your bishop so that it looks at its pawn, but 
I've uh, I've seen that as well. I've also seen the queen stepping up to d2 in order to connect the rooks. But it's something I'm going to be honest, where I've struggled with handling this type of position. And another plan that I've seen, you know, bishop to g5, as I mentioned, where you try to gain control over the light square. What you're indicating here, which is 100% the correct thing to point out, is it's kind of a slow maneuvering position. We often tend to think of the Sicilian, the Nidorf, that's aggressive. And that is true. Same with the King's Indian. These are aggressive openings, but sometimes they actually end up in closed positions where players are maneuvering about trying to come up with a better strategy. And one of the ideas that you mentioned, Bishop F3, I've also seen along with Bishop G5, Knight D2, Knight F1, yeah. Knight back to e3. It's such a long journey, but because there are no pawn breaks that are immediately apparent, it allows you to take this kind of time. So both players have to look out for the pawn breaks where they can possibly happen. d5 is completely controlled. And I like your bishop f3 move, by the way. I think it's a very smart move to shut things down. Uh, so both players will struggle with figuring out how to actually break open the position a little more. Because for now, there's an open c file. Black has her queen there. There's an open D file. White has her queen lined up along that file. So there, it's a game that is going to be a huge struggle. And that's why we see Kateri Lakno deep in thought here, not sure whether she'll play Bishop G5 or Bishop F3 or Queen D2. Uh, so many possible moves here and finding the right one. Well, there may be a, several moves that are equivalent in value, but finding that right plan, not so easy. Yes, and, the, and when we look at those moves as well, they're not that intuitive as well, because you mentioned knight to d2, like that actively stepping the knight back. And I mentioned putting the bishop on f3, which is, when you look at it, just a ridiculous looking move, right? <laughs> <laughs> you put your bishop on the most active squares. I'm being sarcastic. <laughs> but it's, it's absolutely not the case. So... I mean, but when you kind of go deeper, you actually see, okay, it makes a lot of sense. I love your knight to d2 plan, by the way, because when you dig below the surface, you understand that this knight on b3 actually doesn't have a point to it, unless it's supporting an a5. And if you take the decision, actually, I'm not going to get an a5, then move that knight away from that particular square and get it to e3. My coach always would say knights on b3, b6, G6 and G3, these squares on the knight's file, uh, they're, they're always poorly placed. And of course, it's a bit hyperbolic, but they often stay there a little bit too long because this pawn on B6, three squares away, completely controls it. The E5 pawn takes away another forward jump, so it's not on its best square. That doesn't mean you move it just yet, but in the future, you can't think about stepping back to leap forward later. So... Ivanka, this one is very close for now. I like that. It's such a tense battle. I believe it should be a quite a long game, but it's not in the style of, say, the Humpy Canary game against Salimova or even the game we saw earlier between Goryachkina and Vaishawa. This one is really close and will remain so for the time being. Totally. And uh, I just wanted to say one thing about your knights uh, being on G6 and b6 judith actually said the same thing yesterday as well so i didn't know that rule so now i do but uh, on that note let's go to the bird's eye view and take a look at what's developing and i'm gonna leave the decision to you robert oh i thought you were my friend you're making me oh okay these. in that case i i have <laughs> i have one i have a game <laughs> okay. i was secretly hoping that you'd choose but i thought it'd be nice so it's the uh it's the game between mizichik and lating j and the reason why i want to have that is because mizichik she has blinked she has changed well she's changing the pawn structure with her last move and she's asking lay what is she going to respond bond with because the pawn on d5 is now under fire well i'm gonna ask you yvonka since you were so kind to ask me a difficult question do you like this decision from Musichuk? because she has uh, decided to push her pawn forward but she also may saddle herself with this isolated queen pawn uh, for the long run so first instinct and of course we'll dive into the details but do you like this decision from the white side 
Sorry, I know I just said we're friends. It's, it's, it's I, an interesting <laughs> decision, right? I, I'll be, I'm going to say I like it in terms of a commentator because it livens things up for us. But in terms of a practicality, well, you certainly sharpened the game because as you say, you know, you've given yourself a pawn weakness on d4. And it's also possible for Leighton J. You know, she also has active pieces is what I want to say. Her bishop is standing there on h5. It covers the potential weak spot at f7. And it suddenly becomes anyone's game. Whereas before, it felt like it was more headed towards a draw. It could, could have headed towards a draw. Do you want to sharpen things up so that all three results are possible? Whereas keeping the pawn structure symmetrical... There's there's kind of like less margin for error. Error, you have to make a whole series of bad moves. Whereas here, anything can happen. And it reminds me of why I love being a commentator so much is because when we suggest moves like C4, we don't have the responsibility that comes with such a pawn push. And many people, you know, who are in the audience, like, it's just a simple move. You're trying to trade pieces, but no, there are some huge drawbacks, but also some benefits. So if we analyze a little bit, I think the most natural move when someone puts a pawn in your path, you take it. If you take on C4, White has this choice of taking with the bishop or also with the knight up to c4. And this is the whole point of this push. You gain activity for your pieces, whether it was the bishop on c4 or the knight here. This knight on c4, clearly a much better piece than was previously set on d2. So Ivanka, we can completely understand why the move was made. It also opens up the queen's path on uh, this diagonal, maybe to a score like b3 in the future. But the responsibility that we're talking about, d4 is isolated. The d5 square in front of it could be blacks to occupy. Aaron Nimzovich famously wrote in my system, you always want to blockade that square in front of an isolated pawn. So it's a kind of double-sided uh, decision, and it's one that has a huge commitment involved with it. it totally. And it's full of decisions as well, because uh, if black, as you are indicated, takes that pawn on c4, like, how do you recapture? Do you capture with the knight? Is it better to capture with the bishop? I, it's quite funny because you were leaning towards knight takes pawn. I was leaning towards bishop takes pawn. Both of and you can see sense. from the evaluation bar that they're probably the same. There's nothing in it. Like, yeah, it's the same sort of evaluation. And you see even the more depth the engine gets, it's like going ever so slightly better for black back to the middle it's ever so slightly better for white and that's the truth of this position is it's dynamically balanced with even material but both sides are playing for different things and some decisions may be very difficult but the point that you made ivanka and you made it before we've even seen a capture is the bishop on h5 is actually superbly placed because it protects this pawn on f7 which means queen b3 if you gave white a free turn it's not a double attack anymore it only hits the b7 pawn because f7 which the queen and bishop are lining up on, is already defended. That's a critical point, one that we should not take for granted. And actually, it could help black not just survive in positions like this, but even be able to fight for an initiative because the bishop is on that correct diagonal on h5. Totally. And uh, it's a nuisance as well, because even in the other line, so say go back to the decision after pawn takes pawn, if you go knight takes pawn, the bishop is just pinning that uh, queen on d1. Knight can't move. So now, like moves like knight to c6 might might suddenly grow in attractiveness because then you're targeting d4 at the right time. Everything is done with the right time. And again, there's so many decisions that white has to take. Like for instance, in this particular position, in the, the one that you have, is that after knight takes bishop, do you want to make that trade? Because the more pieces that get traded off, the simpler it becomes for black to attack the pawn on d4 there. You can even see the evaluation bar going, no, it was a bad move. And it's, this is kind of what I was getting at. And whether as a commentator, I thrive in these complex positions where I have I carry no risk whatsoever. <laughs> I don't feel I don't have an emotional attachment to either white or black. But as a player, I'm thinking, hmm. I'm not sure on a practical level that was the best move. But your explanations in these positions are really something that everyone at home should take notes 
when they hear you because what you said, trading pieces when you're the one with the isolated pawn, it allows your opponent an easier time to attack. We just traded one knight for one bishop, but we already see the isolated pawns in trouble. What would we love to do? Can I pick up this a2 pawn and put it on c3? Create a little pawn chain? A pawn's best friend is another pawn. You're not getting that here, so sorry, pawn on d4. You don't get a best friend. <laughs> You're a bit alone in the center, and black is quickly piling up the pressure. So really instructive stuff. I think that this position, it's uh, much more difficult than initially met the eye. That move c4, there are big decisions from Lei Tingji's perspective. Do I even take in the first place? That's not forced at all. Uh, do we really want to take on d5? Give ourselves that isolated pawn that we're talking about? Even if you win a pawn for free, you're likely to lose it back later. And we'd have just seen Lei Tingji decide to capture. So I do think it's the right choice. But as we continue talking, Ivanka, and as Muzichuk just took with the knight, things are getting double-edged. Uh, we are going to get much more life in the position and Knight C6, quickly, the response from Lei Tingzhi. You were uh, right on the call there. So the D4 pawn is loose. It's tender. And Ivanka, I'm going to ask a difficult question. So I'm, I'm prefacing it with this. Is white going to throw this pawn forward to block the pin of this Knight on F3? Um... Oh, Damn a second. <laughs> Did it just come? <laughs> it literally just appeared on the board. I, I was, I'm really happy that this happened because I was going to put my foot, my foot in my mouth and go, no, I would <laughs> never do that. <laughs> sure enough, it's on the board, commentator's curse, and then bishop to g6 quickly played. Okay, that was a massive decision. Bishop takes bishop, pawn takes okay so this is the idea well this is this is nice this is nice stuff you know just secure this bishop on g5 make sure it has a permanent pin against this knight on f6 and presumably anna just uh, wants to step her king up to g2 at the right time connect the rooks and pile on the pressure this is this is lovely actually I, I like I like the creativity here. It, it's 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 not something I would have played, but then again, you learn something new every day. And creativity is a good word for it because this is such a committal decision. Right now, at this moment, White would love to bring the pawn back to G two. That's against the rules. You can't push pawns backwards, and you wouldn't have been able to achieve the position that you have without pushing the pawn forward. So you did unfortunately create some holes in the position f4 is a square that black may try to get to later but for now white can play queen b3 for example put pressure connect these rooks at long last and very importantly the knight on f3 is no longer pinned it is successfully defending this pawn in the center and maybe we'll hop to square e5 later so you've got a creative decision from anna muzichuk but also a responsible one and she has given herself some weaknesses in the position, but also some strength. So it's a position with pros and cons. Yeah, it's certainly, yeah, there's a lot of cons though. I don't know. <laughs> no, there's a lot. no, this is just my, per this is my personal preference, just talking. I know people who like uh, activity, who like dynamism are going to be cheering on this decision, but I am worried about the king's safety of Anna. Because, yeah, you know, if you do move your queen out to b3, I'm already seeing there are situations where black could maybe go queen to either c8 or queen to d7, and there's already sacrifices brewing on g4. It's a really good point that black can also look to sacrifice pieces yeah. to open up the king. And uh, yeah, it feels like white is first to the attack and a one off attack on the b7 pawn. But maybe there will be a pawn push to d5 at the right moment. So these decisions, none of them are easy. And that g4 push, we don't take it lightly. And I, maybe Lei Tingji is the happy one here. Because from the black side, when you get an exchange French, oftentimes it's like, all right, symmetrical, I'll be slightly worse, but try to hold the draw. Now we do not have symmetry. We do not have what many would perceive as a boring position. We have excitement. And Lei Tingji has a very exciting style. Yes, she does have an exciting style. And also reminds me a little bit that uh, Anna Muzitik, she used to, back in the pandemic days, she used to stream. And her nickname for herself was Miss Strategy. 
I think. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know whether it's a good sign or not. But okay, but Anna, she is a phenomenal player. Let's not forget that she's one of the few women to have uh, broken the 2600 rating barrier. So let's uh, leave Anna in this position and uh, let's go to the game between uh, Goreshkina and Vaishali. And okay. Let's check out the bird's eye view and true to Vaishali's style, look at that. There, Vaishali has got very active pieces. It's the game in red. And now her knight has moved across towards the king side. And there is this kind of framework of an attack building. The light squares. I know exactly mm -hmm. what Vaishali is aiming for is if she can trade off these light square bishops the White King is in big trouble. So earlier, I asked you if you like playing against or with the Isolated Queen Pawn, and I was with you. I like playing against it, but I like the position that Vaishali has, so maybe I should revise my earlier statement. They're difficult positions to handle. You know, instinctively, I like those long-term weaknesses, but like I said, on a practical level, when you're facing them and you're facing like this type of position with the white pieces with, as you've highlighted, a bishop coming to e4, and potentially a knight sticking itself on f3 then you you're scared i am i am i I'm, mean i'm admitting it <laughs> yeah exactly and, and it is not just those two pieces that are coming towards white's king it's also a, potentially a rook lifting up to e6 swing itself over to h6 and yeah you you got to be worried here so now Goreshkina has to kind of start mending her position and she went for h4. Oh, wow. okay. That's a... You know, <laughs> that's a big decision, isn't it? Yeah. How do you feel about Massive it? Massive decision. First? Well, this is the thing, you know, before my commentary days, I would have said, yeah, I love it because I love pushing pawns. I absolutely adore it. But having said, sat next to the wonderful David Howell for quite a long time, who, who doesn't advocate for pushing pawns, now I'm really <laughs> cautious about it. Yeah, age four, you can't undo that because there's a saying that says when you push pawns, you leave behind weak squares. And it's left behind h3, g4, so the big question now is, do you go knight to e4 and sit comfortably with your knight there, or do you go knight to e6 and start putting pressure on this bishop? That is a very difficult answer, and I mean that sincerely. That These are tough choices. Your knight came from e4, went back to g5, and the point was to trade off the light square bishops and go for the attack. So I do like Goryachkin's choice. It seems risky. We often tell players especially those who are just starting out, don't push pawns in front of your king because it makes your king feel weak. But sometimes when many of your opponent's forces are surrounding your king, you need your pawns because when a pawn attacks a knight, the knight is a more valuable piece. And now that knight has to uh, get up on its high horse and run away. So uh, this knight is going to giddy and it might go to e6. It might go to e4. I'm not sure. But either way, it's going away from the direct attack against the white king. And Ivanka, mm -hmm. I think I'm inclined to go back to e4, if I'm honest, because going back to e6, I'm not really threatening to take this bishop on d4. All of these trades, as you pointed out very astutely, trades favor the side who is playing against the isolated pawn. So if you keep trading pieces on the d4 square, white is very happy to stick a queen there and blockade that isolated d5 pawn. Yep. I am also inclined to recentralize the knight to e4 as well. And again, uh, h4, I just can't get over that move. <laughs> I, I like it, but I also I dislike it at the same time because the chicken in me is always thinking, well, what about the potential of uh, the position opening up? And once a knight reaches on e4, that pawn on h4 is that hook. It can be, the position can be opened up by like kind of accelerating the play with g5 at the right moment. Also, the rook can still swing over. The bishop will still offer a trade of light square bishops with bishop to h3. Yeah, it, it, it's a crazy, crazy position. Very complicated. 
It is, but because I can, I'm going to give it a gold pawn. I really like this move, honestly. I I think that it was well timed. I, I know we're feeling mixed, There's some ambivalence here, but I just I don't know. I think that allowing Black to simply trade the light squared bishops would have played Device Charlie's favor, both stylistically and objectively in the position. So I I have to commend Goryachkin. It's not an easy choice, but I think we both are kind of looking at this like, hmm, you know, we're kicking that knight away and suddenly the white king does feel safer and black may have something more to prove long term because that imminent attack is no longer there. Yeah. But one of the actually one of the reasons I just want to kind of point out one of the reasons I was drawn to actually maybe moving my knight back to e6 was I was anticipating what white wanted to do. And white wants to put a knight on f4. So right. and just to kind of hold firm the king side and then once you've done that, you can then focus on completing development and just centralizing your rooks and putting pressure on d5. So I guess we also have to think about what white wants. And she does retreat the knight to e6. You made such a good point there. Like that process of elimination between two, to my eyes, equivalently good, but very different moves because they have different plans associated with them. I, I like what you said, knight f4 was such an annoying move to go right after this d5 pawn, that the knight on e6 is very well positioned, putting pressure on d4, stopping knight f4, protecting g7 just in case. So I think uh, it also stops rook c5, if that rook ever wanted to join the party. So I, I do really like knight e6, and Vaishali agreed with your line of logic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was... What a battle here is going on. I, what I love about the game so far is that almost every single one of them are kind of just quite sharp, quite tense, but in different ways. Here we have that battle between a long-term play versus short-term play. In other games, we've seen Humpy just immediately go for the attack. Difference and difference in balance in pawn structures. I think that seems to be the theme actually in today's round, but knight to e6, Goryashkina now has to make a response. And this is a moment, right? How do you continue playing? Queen. Another, <laughs> another tough question, Ivanka. I don't, <laughs> Queen d2 or something that does look natural. Uh, right. Bishop c3, if you want to keep that bishop on the board, is always available. But I'm not sure if knight takes d4 is a threat, as we were mentioning earlier. So yeah, these are not easy choices. No, not not easy indeed. And okay, maybe maybe in fact you actually have to anticipate what your opponent wants to do as well, because if I ask myself if I were black, what would I play? I would play bishop e four. Trying to trade off the light squared bishop. Exactly. I I'm uncomfortable with the fact that uh, white has the bishop pair. So this would be something that I would be drawn to, and the question is. Can white prevent this move? It's a really good question. Um, doesn't look easy to stop. F3 is not a move that you really ever want to play from the white side because you loosen your control of E3 and G3. So bishop E4 is coming your way. And maybe that also means bishop G4 could be an annoying threat pinning this knight. So mm -hmm. that bishop has its options. And black looks really solid here. That D5 pawn, sure, it's a long-term weakness. But how do you actually get at it is a completely different question and one that I'm struggling to answer. And it also makes me want to move my queen a little bit more. So I'm not walking into any pins or any problems. Really uh, a lot of options here for both sides. And I love these types of games to commentate because I struggle playing them. As I, I mean, Some people are spoiled by choice. Other people, they're frazzled by it. They... That's one of the great things about being a commentator. When there are multiple choices, you know, we have the evaluation bar, we have objectivity to guide us. But uh, the players, alas, they do not have that. Shall we go back to the bird's eye view and uh, take a look at the current games? Because I did mention the game between uh, Salimova and Humpy, and I'm dying to revisit that one because it's not often we see Black go on the offensive immediately. Pushing the H pawn up the board. 
<laughs> I think we have to. We just don't have a choice. By the way, Goryashka did move her queen up to d2, so we were correct in anticipating her reply. But this position, I think we can go back a few turns just to show how we got here. Uh, we've only seen three moves played since. e3, h5, knight f3 to d2. So the attack looked so strong, Ivanka, that we see one of these counterintuitive moves. Instead of developing your queenside knight, she brings back her knight from f3, but we quickly see the point that after h4, that's very obvious, knight takes e4. Very importantly, d takes e4. So Ivanka, another difficult choice in the center, but I believe f takes e4 would have quickly allowed one of the ideas you mentioned earlier, f3, and that seems a bit more problematic for black to open up the entire center and actually kind of go after the black king that's sitting there. Yep. Yep. So uh, decision time from Humpy and Humpy, I agree with that, took with the D pawn. And after knight c3, there's no stopping Humpy. Humpy has to do something now. And the question is what? Oof. Can I can I do something? Can I teleport my queen to h6? <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, yeah, well, on that subject, on that subject, yes. Yeah. So, should you be taking on g3? Because if you take with the f pawn, oh. I'm, I'm asking, can I accelerate the play by being extremely greedy? Let's <laughs> analyze that. That's that's a really good call by you because a lot of players would like to take away from the center, even though it breaks one of the principles to help the king. But Ivanka, you brought it up, so I'll let you go forward with the line. Be yes. Greedy. Okay. Do so. It. So white, okay, so there we actually see Humpy taking that pawn on g3. So the reason why white might be tempted to take away from the center is because white will say, hang on a second, I don't want an open h line for black to line up a battery of a queen and rook again on it. So instead of you to go f takes g3, keeping the line semi-close, well, there is a problem though, because the king stands on an open diagonal. And this means, and trust me, I've fallen for this one quite a few times, knight takes d4. So this is the issue. Just go for it completely. Queen Just takes pawn. And uh, now you can see the whole point is that the knight on c3, it's loose it's going to fall off the board. And so you recover your material with a gain. You know what's fascinating, Yamanka? So this would clearly be good for black, getting your knight back and being two pawns to the good. But after knight takes d4, I, I was making moves very quickly and wasn't intentional to hide anything. The engine actually like went up in white's favor, which to me is very surprising. And I mean, I'm going to use it. Knight takes Sorry, e4, but... right? Could there be ideas well, of knight? What if I just take it? Like, if you take here, I'm still going to trade queens and get your rook in the corner. So that feels very promising for black, right? Like, just to show and not just say in my head. Yeah. If we go king h1, I take this rook in the corner, and now black will be up at least in exchange. Totally. But there was um, a beautiful idea, which is to go bishop takes e4 instead of taking the knight. Does that work? Oh, oh, maybe queen to g4? Ah, look at you. Yes, that's queen to g4. Okay. Yeah, because I wanted to get a check on g6. Mm -hmm. Unsafe king. This is really an instructive position for those of you uh, who want to improve your own chess. It's really good to look at tactics like this. And even myself, I was like, knight takes d4. That's obviously going to be good for black. And then it was I saw that white actually had the upper hand slightly because of this exact sequence with the queen coming out to g4 it's not going to be game over in fact the really uh, tricky position continues here as black can make a move like king f7 and stop the check but the whole point is that let's say you go all in for the attack queen g6 check is Yvanka's point and then you bring your rook to d1 and that's a massive issue where you are losing at least a piece back and likely a lot more your king is getting hunted so a really beautiful line and I think Salimova immediately rejected F takes G3 because of knight takes D4, but there was that tactical flaw for black. Knight takes E4, just to go back those few moves. And Ivanka, that's critical. This was a really, really important moment with knight takes E4, uh, excuse me, knight takes E4 available because in the game, now there's no taking back. H takes G3 and that open file 
is a long-term issue that white needs to contend with. So the engine doesn't hate white's position, but that was a really critical moment. And one that when you study chess rather than play it, you may be able to come up with uh, that solution. But when you're at the board, Ivanka, you're not even thinking. You're saying, I eliminated that possibility because of my exposed king on the diagonal. But it actually was available if she had more time to sit and calculate. And she just says, I need to make certain moves quickly. Yes. And uh, this is uh, also one of the dangers that uh, one can fall into in chess. And that is just simply making those recapturing moves very, very quickly. It's happened to me thousands and thousands of times that my hand has just moved. It's just automatically assumed that I can't make another potential move. And, and then afterwards, the brain kicks into gear. Does you find this happens to you as well, Robert? <laughs> you a make a move percent. instinctively and then your brain goes, well, hang on a second. You could have gone like that. <laughs> Why did you, you just not wait? <laughs> have you ever made um, the wrong move order? Like where you, yes. you're, you play the second move of a sequence first and you're just like, what, what was that? Yes, many, many times I, I've done that. And uh, I've, 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 I've done some weird things in my chess career. One of the weirdest things was um, I attacked someone's queen and my brain went, you're, you're attacking their queen. And they didn't move their queen. And then my brain, she, I think she did a move like h g 3 and the hand came out as quickly as possible, captured back the pawn. And then I was like, hang on a second. <laughs> Why did I not capture the queen? Uh, yeah, yeah, it, it's... it's I, I, you know, we've, oh, I've done all sorts of mistakes and I've, I've done some good moves as well, but, um, yeah, HG3, but the worst, I can tell you the worst feeling is when your brain kicks in the second that you've hit the clock. Like, why oh. did you not work 10 seconds earlier, but HG3 and a very interesting decision now for Humpy because she has to get her King developed as, as you kind of alluded to, you kind of need to get your queen on the H line. And I wonder what's going to happen next, because again, it's not easy to get this bishop on C8 into the game. This knight on C6 is on a bad circuit. So how to progress? And I can actually see this position going wrong for Humpy if she doesn't react in the most promising way. Like, for instance, Salomova is potentially threatening to go f3, explode open the position, and start playing against this king in the center. I actually was going to quickly say that h 3 was not a bad move, and we were not criticizing Salimova. It was just sometimes you just completely throw an option out the window, but the one she chose is clearly uh, totally fine for white. f3 is a great idea, as you're mentioning. At some point, black needs to be a bit concerned about d5 for now. It's not available because the knight loose on c3. But if this rook comes to c1 or something like that, d5 opening up the center where black's king could be in trouble. And this queen, it just desperately needs to be on a square like h6 or h7. I'm just drawing arrows to get the queen to the open file. But even when it gets there, the rook slides to e1, and it's only a single check on h2. It does not immediately lead to checkmate. So Salimova, she could actually turn this one not around because she's hasn't been in trouble, but she could turn Humpy's ambition against her, especially if this king remains in the center and your idea at the right moment with F3, or even, I wouldn't be totally shocked, a knight sacrifice mm -hmm. on E4. If you bring this queen to C2, sack on E4, this black king in the center will be in serious danger. So Salimova will have her chances. She certainly will. And it's still very much a high pressure situation for both of the players. And I think this is the perfect note for us to head in towards a break. But do remember that chess.com is thrilled to support fellow game changer Chess Up, the record breaking company taking the gaming world by storm with their brand new Chess Up 2. This physical electronic board syncs to your chess.com rated games, which you can then save and analyze on. Chess.com with, with built-in Wi-Fi, a touchscreen and touch sense pieces, Chess Up 2 supports beginning players, players in training and casual games between friends and family. For a limited time, save $100 when you pre-order your Chess Up 2 on Kickstarter now. So head over to go.chess.com slash chess up to or use exclam chess up in chat to unlock this offer and take your game to the next level.
Want chess on the go? Check out these essential chess apps. Turn your phone into a chess clock. Improve your game. Find a new challenge. A safe place for kids. Fun and adventure. And of course, play. Learn more at chess.com slash apps. Hello, can I get 50 elo back please because one of my friends played on my account and lost 50, thank you. I've got friends like that too, when I'm frustrated or in a bad mood, <laughs> something or strikes Maybe my friends, a little they... bit, you know what, maybe a little, maybe, you know, I don't know. It's been a good night. <laughs> yeah. No, I have friends just like that, man, they, they come on my account, I wake up in the yeah. morning, yeah. Well, the good news is um, better to have friends who lose you rating points than gain you rating points because then your account might be closed for cheating. Pro tip. I am deeply sorry for the language I used. I will never ever ever use vulgar language again. I'm sorry please unban me please. You are my star and my sunshine. <laughs> I go to bed dreaming of you and when I wake up I think of you again so I ask kindly please chess.com come with me to POM. Hugs and kisses. <laughs> we love you too. Unmute that man. We love you too. <laughs> I love all members. I feel like we were being taunted just a little bit there. Um, but at the same time, I'm not one to judge anyone's speech impediment, you know? And so, welcome, welcome, you whiskily wabbit. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> and, and it's a gaming site. You know, when people write in and they've got the right sense of humor, it means a lot to us. Because, you know, yeah, that's, that's sure. the kind of um, the Good vibes stuff. we want.
And we are back with the coverage of round four of the women's candidates and Robert. It's been a fun start. We've seen the players adopt high risk, high reward strategies. And how, what have your impressions been so far? I like that the players are going for it. They're not just taking it easy, heading into the rest day. They haven't started a day early. No, as you see from left to right, bottom row as well, everyone is in for a pretty energetic clash. And I, mean, I think we spent a lot of time in the top right and Humpy did just bring her queen up a square to D7. We know where she's aiming for towards the white king. But I would say the game as well in the bottom right, that one is looking spicier then we left off between Muzichuk and Lei Tingji. Let's uh, dive into that game. And here, well, I can see that the players did follow our recommendations. And uh, now is a big moment from Anna, where she stepped forward with a pawn to d5, attacking the knight. Oh, it, it's, it's such a complex position, this. But it's again, I was kind of alluding to this high risk, high reward. Anna is gambling here. She did mention that she felt that she'd gotten off to a bad start in the tournament. So she wants to set the scene that, you know, she's doing well. And one way to do that is to just start putting the pressure on Lei. The big question is where is that knight headed to? Is it headed <laughs> towards? There's not that many squares. No, but they all look appealing. 95 looks very nice to my eyes. 97 doesn't look so bad, putting pressure on the D5 pawn. And even knight B4, adventurous, but similarly putting this pressure on the D5 pawn, though it's on a loose square. So I don't think knight B4 is that easy to play without serious thought. But Yvanka, as you mentioned, all squares are possible for that knight. Yes. And I saw it's getting carried away because I've been uh, looking, well, there's been a consequences of white just advancing the pawn G2 to G4. And that is if black is able to get a rook to E4 to sacrifice a piece and get the queen onto G4, then either this attack is gonna end in a draw or it's gonna be checkmate. That's a really good idea. I, I don't think it quite works because I think you, or I could tell in your voice, you, you're acknowledging that, oh, it doesn't work in this position. But if you allow this rook to sacrifice itself on g4, you're in trouble. But I think white is just in time to get rid of this bishop first. And I think we should show this just because it's super mm -hmm. instructive. I uh, will say rook e4, white takes this knight on c6. And after rook takes g4, takes back, we'll see that the queen takes on g4 with check. And after the king goes to h1, oh, at the very least, black has a draw by repetition. Okay, we see the eval bar off the side saying that's the best choice, but white can't successfully block on h2 because the bishop and queen line up on that square, which means that we would indeed just get a draw because black is just one move too slow to deliver the checkmate as this knight will get rid of this bishop first. Yep. And uh, there's something that uh, Lei Tingje will have in her mind. But for the time being, yeah, you need to move the knight. And... This is the big question, what to do with it. It's really hard. I, I think 95, what, what we should ask the question that you have been posing, which is a really good one. What is Muzichuk's idea? What is she aiming for? Why would she not be afraid of giving up this e5 square? And I'm guessing it's because when we get a position, let's say you take with the pawn on e5, now can white just grab b7? That pawn is hanging. I don't see a checkmate attack against the white king. And so I feel like this is her main idea is if we just trade a few pieces, I can grab your loose pawn. Yes. And also the consequence of putting a pawn on E5 means that you block up your rook. So you now have to start developing your rooks again, getting them back into worthwhile lines. So yeah, I don't, I, I'm not a fan of, uh, letting go of my pawns. I'm not a fan of uh, blocking up the potential of the rook. So that's why I'm not headed, not kind of inspired by knight e5. Oh, by the way, are you a pawn grabber? <laughs> I am, but not if it means my king is really unsafe. I do protect my king first and foremost. I'm a, more of a, I would say, maneuvering type of player rather than going all out for the crush. What about you? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I am a pawn grabber. <laughs> I, ha I have been known to grab unnecessarily dangerous pawns. <laughs> and I've been told off many a time for that one. They say, Yori, you had a simple position and now not so simple anymore. <laughs> All because of my greed. No, uh, <laughs> so yeah, this is, but this is a really interesting issue. So say you were to just, uh, move the knight. Uh, <laughs> the problem See? is, is that if you move the knight somewhere, you, you put it on a really poor circuit. So if you move the knight to D8, what on earth is doing there? I mean, it's completely dominated by the pawn on D5. So no, not good at that. And if you put the knight on E7, yep. It gets in the way. It again, it doesn't have a, any great squares to go to, although it does help support an F5 pawn break. That's a good point but, because I was not looking in that direction and that could be scary for the white king. Right. But at the same time, do you want to be playing F5? This is such a complicated game. Do you really want to be doing that and allowing white knight to enter E5? Do you want to be weakening your own king? It's yes. difficult. Yes, because it's not our game. We're commentators. We like huge fights, and F5 is bringing it to the white king. And we said this earlier, Ivanka, white's best move is bringing this pawn back to G2. In all seriousness, yes. if this pawn were on G2, white would be very happy. But because this pawn is so out there, even moves like F5 that you recommended are scary for this king on G1. I prefer black, if I'm being honest, at this stage. Uh, knight e5 would not be a good move. Trading will help protect the white king. So knight e7, that looks very calm and also has a clear point targeting this pawn on d5, getting f5 ready. I like this suggestion, knight to e7. Oh, you also have with the knight going to e7, because uh, again, you want to put your knights on good squares. Now, this may or may not be a great idea, but there is a square on f4. That's a nice outpost for a knight. So you could try to get it there via weird, wonderful moves like g5, knight to g6, Ooh. and in the knight comes to f4. And I'm drawing these arrows in blue because I actually really like it. And I think that's a annoying. This g4 move, if you could push that pawn back even to g3, you take away that access point, but not with the pawn on g4. And this, everybody, is why we tell you to think not just once, but maybe triple check your pawn pushes in certain moments because they leave weak squares behind. Same deal with this d5 push. Let's not forget this bishop at some moment can change diagonals, and that could be something to Lei Tingji's benefit. So I, I yeah. do prefer the black position here. I think that white is the one extending, trying to come up with ideas to go after Lei Tingji, but sometimes you sort of bite off more than you can chew, and a player who is ambitious can help their opponent. In this case, both players would like to get back to an even score. Totally. And uh, before we leave this game, can we just consider what happens if white just simply grabs material? So knight to, e knight to e7, queen takes pawn. Okay, I think I'll go. I, I was going to go rook a to b8, but I know what you're going to do. You just told me you're a pawn grabber, so you're going to take as many as possible. So I'll bring my e8 rook away from the center. Yes. Yes, and this is the the lovely point to put in the knight to e7 is that the pawn on d5 is also loose and can be taken, and there the knight jumps into f4, and then black is just so much better here. Now this pawn on d5 is very much needed in order to cramp the white, sorry, the black position. And it's a good lesson that what a pawn is hanging doesn't mean you go and grab it, and I don't think as we're suggesting. Anna's going to grab it. She'll play a move like rook A to D1, keep that pawn in the center and get a rook behind it. So that pawn on B7 at some point uh, might be loose, but now is not that point. And I think that as you see Anna looking away from the board, uh, trying to catch some of the other action, uh, she probably is feeling a bit uncomfortable given the looseness of her position. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's uh, looking around. Is, is something happening in the playing hall. Because you have to remember that this is the first time in history that the open candidates and the women's candidates are happening at the same time. And the players are, well, the, 
the tournaments are happening with different time controls is there you can see the format for the women's section is that it's 30 minutes sorry 90 minutes for 40 moves with a 30 second time bonus per move and of course you do get 30 minutes added after move 40 so the the open section they are playing a completely different time control where there's no added time no time increment until they've passed move 40. so i was just thinking in terms of time scrambles they're going to be completely different nature right one of them is going to be a lot more intense than the other they could happen at different times and this could be distracting you know, it's funny because when I play, that is not a distraction I typically have to think about when you're in one big tournament, but that is something that must happen in these fields because, as you said, time trouble is happening at different times, and that's distracting. But I also would be distracted just by some of the other games. You're looking at your other competitors, but then you're like, wait, that there's a knight sacrifice in that game. There's an open H file in that one. I, I think that some people in the audience right now, they know what I'm talking about, where you play in a chess tournament and you have a hard time focusing only on your own game because some of the others out there are entertaining to watch. And Yvonka, how about you? When you play in tournaments, are you the type of player who kind of like Gukesh just sits in their chair the entire time and is singularly focused on your own game? Are you somebody who walks around, takes in the sights and the other games? Yeah, I, I'm a pacer and uh, I do sometimes get fascinated by games, but they tend not to be the ones that I can glance at. I sometimes get fascinated by the board right next to me and I start <laughs> trying to figure out <laughs> exactly what they should be playing. And I had one one situation just now in the Norwegian team championships where I got, I completely forgot about my own game and I started obsessing about my teammates game. And I was like, oh, you had this amazing resource. and you know, when their game finished, I like turned from, it was my, it was even my move. This is how <laughs> terrible it was. And I, I turned and I was like, I think you could have played this. And then I went and, and then I forgot, you know, I remembered myself and I was like, what am I doing? I have my own game to play. It's my move. The clock is ticking down. <laughs> and, and the worst thing is that I then made a blunder. Oh. <laughs> oh. and it was level before that but I, it, it was kind of slowly slipping away from me but it was so annoying I was like okay and but uh this game that my teammate played fascinated so me so much that uh, when I got back to the room I wasn't checking my own game I was checking <laughs> whether my suggestion <laughs> was actually working <laughs> that's hilarious and actually unexpected I felt like you know, if I just considered you as a player, I was like, you definitely focus, fix it on your own board. But sometimes you can't help but be distracted by some of the other games. And I, I would say in this round, if I'm looking across the four boards as we can in the women's can, it's here, the game between Humpy and Salimova, that one is where I would have my, like, is there really a checkmating attack as we see in the upper right? Salimova, she's making just improving moves. Her king still sitting on G1. But that game remains really fascinating, though no action directly against the White King just yet. So uh, we just tuned into the bottom right. I don't know. Where do you want to go, Ivanka? We kind of are spoiled for choice. We are spoiled for choice. And you kind of mentioned indirect action. And that's kind of the theme in the game between Katerina Lagno against Tan Zhong Yi. Because when we left it, it was it just emerged out from the opening and white was having to play unusual moves in order to counter black's potential breakthrough in the center and here i can see a lot of those unusual moves have been played like the bishop has found itself on f3 it looks like a ridiculous square but it has the sole purpose of supporting uh just the breakthrough of uh, on d5 preventing it and now the knight has taken a step back. The queen has also found itself on d3. And the Afric is now on c1. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's not kind of normal, logical chess, at least in the conventional sense. So what, what is happening here? 
<laughs> it feels sort of like the variant fog of war where you can't see uh, you know your opponent's pieces and you're just trying to figure out where your pieces belong and that's what's going on here both players are playing very accurately we should give them credit you see the evaluation were ever so slightly in white's favor as is the case 15 16 moves into most games so the players they are continuing to play accurately and they're following both of our combined ideas the bishop went out to f3 the knight went back to d2 maybe the knight will go back to f1 or at some point you could consider up to c4 depending on how the game continues and one more thing I'd like to note is that if this knight gets to d5, you often would prefer to take with your knight on d5, trade knight for knight, but not in this position because the bishop would have been trapped. And that is exactly why a move like knight c5 is strong, going after the white queen, also freeing up some space for this bishop if it ever were in a direct attack from a pawn. And Yvonne, I'm not taking this knight. No chance, no universe am I giving up my bishop on e3 for this knight on c5, which begs the question, where is this queen going? Is it just stepping back one square? Or is there a universe where it even goes back a second? I don't think f1 is a natural square, so e2 it is. But how is either side going to break through as it's really clogged in the middle of the board? Yeah, it's... It, it, that is the question, and I agree with you. You don't uh, trade that bishop for the knight on c5, and the queen does step back to e2. And it's a really, really cagey position, so to speak, because neither side have a clear-cut plan. I guess maybe I'm going to rewind a little bit and say maybe white does have a plan a little bit of going a5 at the right time and going b4 just uh, stepping backwards in order to go forwards. But it, it's not it's not easy by any means. No. Pushing your B-pawn at any point will attack the knight, but lose control of your own knight. So you don't feel as secure on the queen side. And if black plays rook to c8, uh, it's clearly anticipating a move like b4. But rook to c8 doesn't really threaten anything. I'm just really not sure, Ivanka, I'm going to be totally honest with you. I'm not sure where any of Black's pieces belong. Doubling rooks would make sense when there's a rook on c7, but then I'm like, what next? Give me a, give Black a free turn. What are you going for? I don't I see pawn breaks. No, I don't see any pawn breaks at all for Black. And the more I look at it, the more I think White holds the key to making those pawn advances. So yeah, you know, a5, b4 might not be a good idea now, but a few moves down the line, it could be. And also another move that white could play to expand is simply to go g2, g4. Gain space and- Gain unlike... space and maybe even push g5 and kick that knight away. For sure. And unlike in uh, the Anamuziju game, the white king does not feel particularly open because black doesn't have attackers and white has many pieces uh, towards her own king. So g4 is certainly in the cards. Uh, it's really not easy. I think that some players are better than others at shuffling and essentially doing nothing. I would not be surprised if at some point the engine is like king h8, king g8 is the best move because black has most of her pieces in optimal squares. But as humans, we struggle to do things like that. We're much more likely to try and get this d5 break even if it's bad for us or bring our rook second rook to the c file even if it doesn't have a direct plan in front of it so if i'm, I'm going to try rook c8 i'm going to see if the engine laughs or it stays around the same nope it stays around the same and then it's what's white's move what it, what plans are we going for i'm really uncertain yeah well let's try to expand on the king side if you can humor me <laughs> sure oh the computer says went down a little bit but back towards the center where we essentially yeah. were i'm going to stop your pawn push at least for the moment okay and because i like to push pawns and everything is nicely protected i kind of want to go you're not threatening d5 so as long as i've got d5 under control or oh, you are actually <laughs> it's so hard to count let's, let's count uh, hang on hang on a second <laughs> One, two, three. 
One, two, three. So I think D5 in some of these positions can work out depending on some of these pins here. Mm -hmm. Complicated. <laughs> it is It is complicated. Okay, in that case, before I go G2, G4, let me... Nothing is happening. Nothing bad is happening on the C line. So I can even go Rook to D1. Okay, switch up Rooks. Yes. Yeah, okay, and again, it looks it looks really bizarre what I'm doing, but it, there's some deep meaning, and that's basically I think White should be playing to control the d5 square, and once you've stopped it breaking out, then you can go g2, g4. And I think we should actually show why d5 won't work out in many of these positions. You see the evaluation already go up, and I think because if we start trading, Black's whole idea is that I will trade a bunch of pieces and everything is equal. But I, the problem is you've walked into a pin. So that's going to be a really big issue for you as, uh, well, I guess knight takes c3 will be available because the queen on e2 is placed where it is. But perhaps I can come up with some plans, even just a funny move like queen to e1, mm -hmm. saying you are in this pin and you have to be really careful because I'm going to move my knight out the way and pile up all of my pieces against your knight on d5. Yeah. And uh, this is where White's position just springs to life, right? <laughs> so you don't want to be doing that. And yeah, in the meantime, we do see Tan wait with h6. Patience no... is a virtue, right? <laughs> and then she yeah. is very patient here. She is very patient. But okay, let's. I like my idea of uh, preventing d5 once and for all. Rook d1, okay. Rook to d1, one can shuffle. And what if I just bring my rook over? Just... Yes, and again, you're not breaking out with anything, are you? In, you know what I actually am thinking about now? So h6 makes so much sense to stop bishop g5 and control the square, but can I use the pawn as a hook? Can you just bear with me for a second? I know I might mm -hmm. jeopardize the slight edge white has, but can I bring my king to h2, now play rook g1 and g4? Is that yes. completely wild? No, I, I was thinking that as well. So, But the reason why, but then the whole thing is why put your rook on d1? Why not just go king h2 immediately? Well, to stop that d5 push. Maybe we've successfully been able to hold it down and then go for this because if we just i'm not positive i'm, I'm just speculating uh, so let's say you play king h2 does black have d5 is the question and the answer apparently is is yes so that rook d1 move your move it mm -hmm. was prophylactic okay okay that's that's good to know so king okay so rook to d1 but then this also begs the question that if uh, black is persistent and says rook to d8 I got hmm. nothing better in life. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very tense position. It's not like pieces are staring at each other just yet, but we know the plans here. I, I'm going to, can I get away with knight to c4 is my big question. I, I'm just nervous about it because I'd be putting my p queen potentially in the line of fire, but I think I can do it. Yes. Okay. So let's uh, show why like knight takes a pawn isn't going to be working. You're unleashing this attack, but I get away with yes. it because my rook successfully defends it. And when you mm -hmm. come to uh, fork my pieces, my knight also escapes with tempo and chess is often a game of the tempo. Yeah. Okay. So you can't take the pawn on a4, but what about the pawn on e4? Is that a possibility? Let's see, knight, knight takes e4. I assume no, because you're walking into a pin. So I'm just going to take here. You have to take back. And... and then you can probably go b3. Wow, just calm oh. chess. I could, I could also take oh, knight this t. one. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. So knight, knight c4 is a possibility. So I, we just wanted to highlight that it is what, possible. What's funny? Ivanka is the the eval bar is like right in the middle still or slightly better for white which makes this very appealing from the black side like if it doesn't lose getting rid of white center is usually a pretty smart thing to do 
and knight takes b6. This doesn't end, right? Black can play d5, and white has essentially two extra pawns on the queen side, and black has two extra pawns in the center, and the engine suggests dynamic, ever so slight advantage for white, but let's call it dynamic equality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, this is this is complicated stuff. So, yeah, knight c4, I did like the idea, but then I'm not sure about this type of position. So what do we think? Maybe we should just keep the position again under control for the time being and then go knight c4 when you're ready. So maybe you can go king h2. Aha, king... So like, oh, sorry, I went away from but, our line. The yeah. h6, rook d1. Like rook d8 and yeah some kind of king h2 oh, makes yeah. perfect sense to just... but is d5 in the air i guess that is the question it is always the question and because there are so many pieces i'm just going to count them once more one two three and potentially even a fourth white piece aiming at d5 and black has one two three four of her own it's so difficult to calculate these lines but you know what? I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking that maybe Queen E2 was a mistake. No, not mistake. Let's not be harsh. Inaccuracy. I'm thinking that the Queen might have belonged on F1. Okay, why is that? <laughs> why is that? You might be asking. Why is that? And that's to, to do with some of the lines that we've seen with Knight taking on E4. They've involved as having a defensive resource, Knight takes Knight. And then secondly, is that if we do get this type of position, maybe we can go g4 and go queen to g2 and just stop ah. this breakthrough completely. Queen to g2, king h2, fun, fun, fun on the king side. That's such a good point and alternative. And I think perhaps the queen on f1 would have made it less likely that black plays for d5, but then perhaps played somewhere else because the queen on e2 protects yeah. e4 and is in the center more. But it changes our plans completely with one slightly different square, but you, you raise a really, really good point here. And just to show, because it's always important to show that d5 is the main idea, but, and here after knight takes d5, there is knight takes e3 in some of these positions, but I'm guessing white takes on c5. And after bishop takes c5, this knight moves somewhere and maybe be, uh, something simple like knight b3. There are so many pins everywhere and no knight takes c3 because there's no queen on e2. Yeah. Yes, Wild. but that's the benefit of hindsight, right? That's, uh, yeah. the, that's <laughs> you know, it's it's 2020, as they say. But um, OK, we should just deal with the position in front of us with the queen is on E2. Again, tens. And it's Lagno to play. And we are just uh, thinking about rook to D1. Is there any other possibility? Uh, yeah, many, honestly, we talked about G4, mm -hmm. B4, A5, Rook D1. What, is the what does the computer say is the best, I best move? Let me look. Because often I laugh. find... Are you ready for this? Yeah, go on. It's saying ever so slightly, the second best move is Rook D1 and beating yeah. it out by 0 0.1 is Queen F1. No. <laughs> okay, so go back. Go back to the decision, like when the knight came to c5. What was the best move, queen f1? Let's see. That's a great question. Queen f1 is slightly better. Uh, they're kind of trading places, but queen f1 is ever so slightly better than queen to e2. Yes. Oh, my. That's just not a natural me. move, though. Who wants to put their queen on the first rank? No. No one does. And why would you? Unless you happen to understand the position like five moves down the line when you think, oh, hang on a second, you're actually preventing d5. You're potentially going g4. And what are we seeing b4 played? It's very wow. difficult just to sit back and uh, do nothing b4. Well, this was an idea that I thought about. But the consequence is, is now this rook on c7 is actually going to be attacking the knight on c3. It does have some purpose. What is uh, Lagno's plan? Is, 
is it when the knight steps forward she is so sorry when the knight steps back to d7 is she gonna step forward with the knight she probably has to at some point but i think that black has some plans to double in the c file after of course taking on d5 i i don't know about this it feels really strategically risky but i see the point she's just trying to play in the center and expand but now we have uh, gone from a strategic battle to suddenly there are going to be tactics and loose pieces and squares so we have seen the entire nature of this game change yeah totally before it was a game of kind of wait and see both sides just uh maneuvering as carefully as they can with purpose and here it comes there we see that she, it the whole plan was to put the queen back to d3 she wants to prevent the breakout with d5 okay doing everything she can right just trying yeah desperately to stop this d5 uh, uh pawn push and also rook a3 if you need reinforcements on this knight on c3 can be played so such a delicate position i think that's the way to frame it is that there's all these pawns and squares and now a c file and a d file but i'm liking tan jung -Yi's clock she's done really well with her time management she has and i i'm just uh suddenly just taking in lagno's last this few moves and how the the whole nature of the position has now changed. And Tan now has to play very accurately because if Tan does absolutely nothing, then Lagno will just simply retreat the knight from c3 and go c4, and then go about setting a clamp on the queen side. Does not look pleasant. Uh, I no. think knight d5 at the moment, as you were indicating earlier, it seems to be a bit threatening as well. And totally. one of the reasons why is that black cannot afford to take with the knight because after pawn takes this bishop on e6 is out of real estate and would get trapped. So that you'd have to take with your bishop on d5, which is not always ideal. No, totally not ideal. And again, Lagno is going to be the one taking that space. And it's so much easier to play when you have more space. Okay, you need to have more responsibility, but at the same time, it affords you the liberty of being able to just move your pieces between both sides of the board. And I'm just curious here, is Tan now in like accurate move territory? Can she just play anything or does she have to find the right plan now? I feel like you need to get that plan in because let, I'm going to make it in sort of aimless move, like Rook to D8, just to see how it, the engine responds. And we already see quite a sizable advantage all of a sudden for white. And I think it's because knight d5, as we've mentioned, you can't take with the knight because your bishop on e6 is trapped. This knight on d7 is in the bishop's way. And if you instead say, okay, I see that, I'm not gonna lose a piece. Let me take with my bishop. Your idea from just a moment ago, white can expand with a move like c4. You have great control over these light squares. Black is cramped with this dark square bishop on e7 staring into its own pieces. So white does have firm control. Yeah, and uh, we just saw Tan play rook a to c8, doubling up on the c-line, but it is a critical moment in the game. And um, this is the perfect note for us to go on a very short break, but don't go anywhere because when we come back, we are going to have more of the action to come. This is chess. Chess is an experience. The excitement. The joy. The devastation. The undeniable drive to play again and again. Chess is an experience that's meant to be shared. What if you could experience chess in a completely new way? 
on a real chessboard with the power of AI at your fingertips. This is Chess Up 2. Take everything you love about playing on chess.com and experience it on a real chessboard. Play a blitz match against a random online opponent. Conquer the bot you've been stuck on for months. Or challenge a friend halfway across the world. Chess Up 2 is always ready and always connected with built-in Wi-Fi. Never miss a move with full piece recognition. And review all your games right on chess.com. Chess Up 2 is more than a chess board. It's a chess trainer. If you are new to chess, Chess Up will teach you. If you already know how to play, Chess Up will teach you how to really play. With patented AI assistance, you can balance a match between players of any skill level or hone your skills against one of the built-in AI coaches. The makers of Chess Up 2 are the same team behind the original Chess Up. The best-selling smart chessboard in the world. So whether you're a beginner who wants to learn and improve while you play, or a chess pro who wants to go deeper into the world of chess, experience Chess Up 2 and level up your game. We are back and we left quite a few games at some very critical moments, but things have been taking a turn because during the break, Robert and I were looking at some of the games and we were like, wow, what changes have been made to these positions? So let's take a look at the bird's eye view. And you mentioned, Robert, that your eyes were immediately drawn to the game between Salimova and Humpy. How about we go there? Because things have just leveled up. Yeah, the other games are also interesting. So uh, for those of you who are watching, 
uh, at home, do go on chess.com slash events and you can follow all of the games as you wish. But with such a rich position here, uh, you see that the black queen was able to slide on over. I couldn't get it to h6, uh, but Humpy got it to f7 and potentially to h5 in the future. But something that's really essential for everybody to note is the queen h2. If you could even pick up the queen right now, put an h2, it's just a single check. It's not checkmate. So I know we're tempted. I'm tempted to play queen h5, but you may give up too much. This pawn in the center, for example, and you may not be there in time to go after the white king. So Ivanka, as you look at this position, it's clearly one with lots of tactical pitfalls and some possibilities for sacrifices. Whose king do you actually find to be safer right now? It, it would be Salomova's king. She has the ability to move away with the king to a nice hiding place, as you mentioned. But it's not just that. It's also to do with peace coordination and activity. Humpy's pieces don't leave a favorable impression. The knight is there on c6, doesn't have any good squares to jump into. The bishop is stuck on its starting square, so is the rook on a8. Whereas Salomova, you know, if the position opens up, her knight is well placed to spring into e4. So is the bishop on g2. This bishop on a3 is doing a fantastic job at stopping the black king getting to safety. I I do feel that although the evaluation bar might maybe say it's a slight advantage for white, Humpy is teetering on that precipice. One false move and she's going to go down in flames. Can't take pawn pushes back. They are commitments. They leave squares behind. Your king is sta stationary in the center here, which means that as the position opens up, that king could be in huge trouble. So, for instance, taking this pawn in F3 and allowing the white queen forward, there will be other pawn pushes in the near future, whether it's a D5 or eventually an E4. You want to open that position. But I guess it's not that easy, Ivanka. The more that I think about it, a move like d5 would allow a black knight to hop towards the center. Uh, if we do, in fact, see a trade here, you can't ever push this e-pawn without losing control over the d4 pawn or square, which is incredibly important. So uh, while I am worried about black's lack of coordination, you mentioned all the pieces that I, too, think are not as active as they could be, I don't know how white is able to punish it, at least not in the next few turns, while noting naturally that the e4 pawn is hanging in some of these positions so the i would say the burden is much more on humpy to prove that all of her pawn pushes h5 h4 to take here and then doubling her pawn to the center and not developing her queen side she has a lot to prove and justify but she has taken an f3 so first question Ivanka, after queen takes f3 how do we see humpy following this up because she needs to play actively okay so uh, let's dive in and uh, have a look queen takes f3 and here as you correctly pointed out it's not going to be easy to orchestrate a pawn push so let's focus on development bishop the d7 it's and bishop natural. d7 yeah in order to get the king out of dodge and uh, castle queenside and then maybe think about uh potentially just expanding on the king side a bit more okay so now salimova has one move i was gonna ask you is like the king even safe on c8 because i see this queen and this bishop lined up and i'm worried about some stuff yeah and also there is knight to b5 in the air if you if you so say for instance knight b5 oh. you castle i'll tell you I've been doing puzzle rush survival now for the last <laughs> few weeks because my I come from a family that all play chess and someone has got a high score of 70. <laughs> I can't beat this high score at all. Wow. <laughs> I keep getting 60 and I'm like, no. But here, it's been helping me, Bishop 2, D6. Love it. What a move, what a find. And because I control it, I can do this. I'm going to give you the brilliant symbol because I do think that's a brilliant idea. Uh, you are giving up a bishop, but everyone should pay attention. It's not just a bishop for a pawn. That once this bishop is captured, then we will see the knight hop in. 
with a check to the king and a check to the queen. So Ivanka, that's a really lovely tactic. And it's not just a you know a cheapo, right? It's not like, oh, please take my piece. Oh, I didn't see it. Oh no, my bishop. It's more so that you're trying to win this pawn on c7, which is a really valuable pawn sitting in front of the black king. So really amazing stuff from you that's going to hurt. Yeah, that is going to be quite painful, actually. But is um, so let's go back to bishop d7, knight to b5. Because one of the things I liked about this move is it also just prevents black castling once and for all, right? Because if you go rook to, but no, rook to c8, you're still going to be meeting that with bishop to <laughs> d6. <laughs> That's actually really funny. <laughs> I guess black is bishop d8, so you're not actually like losing the game on the yeah, spot, but it's But super now you've got d5. Ooh, you're just bullying. Bishop d8 to defend, and then d5. Oh, no. The black king is... You know what's funny, Ivanka? Is I look at this, and I even have the evaluation bar off to the side, as do you, and I still think black is toast, and yet the evaluation bar is saying, nah, it's only slightly better for white. Yeah, well, that's just uh, perfection. Don't they say that computers play at the level of God? I think someone, I think Ken, Professor Kenneth Reagan, that once said that if God played chess, they would be at 3,600 and computers these days are like 3,800. So they're better than God. They see everything. <laughs> It's unbelievable that this is an okay position for black. If I were playing a blitz game, I would just resign. I'd be like, okay, I'm toast. My king's in the center. I'm under a, a, all of these uh, pieces are exerting their pressure against it. And yet, nah, not a big deal. But this is, I think, something that you'd want to avoid if you're Humpy Koneru. She is super strong. She, of course, will uh, study the position deeply. She'll find all options available to her. But it just feels from a distance, like something that you just don't want to get into. And that means that after queen takes f3, maybe a6. I know it's a slow move and I'm not actually helping my cause in terms of development, but I am scared of knight to b5. And I can see the evaluation, kind of note that black was okay in that weird variation, but I'm just like, nah, this is something I want to avoid. So a6 feels safer. Yeah. And uh, well, queen takes f3 indeed played by Salimova after a short think and now the ball is in Humpy's court how is she going to unravel her pieces bear in mind that Salimova doesn't have any immediate strikes just yet in the center so Humpy has to do something right now and yeah you're right there are no strikes d5 is always meant by knight to e5 and that knight it's getting hoppy and it's coming on closer and closer mm -hmm. to the white king. So I think it does give Black just enough time to play preventative chess. And it was your idea, Yvonka. You scared me. I'm respecting this knight b5 idea so much that I'm willing to delay my development one more turn to stop that knight from jumping forward. It's a tough move to play with your king in the center. But given the lines we looked at, a6 does feel like a pragmatic choice, just stopping that really pesky knight. Okay, and uh, just out of interest, what does the computer suggest that a humpy should play? This is always good to give that to our audience. Oh, there's a, a an approximate tie between bishop d7 and uh -huh. pawn to a6. So both moves are completely playable, as we've seen. And, and the next level down, the next move down, I mean? One I wouldn't have considered oh, yeah. myself, but rook h6 rook to h6 and i'm just kind of curious as to whether there's a big uh, evaluation drop between these three lines because this is kind of, this is the kind oh. of position where i feel that humpy has to be as precise as possible and if she makes a move like rook h6 i don't see the point of rook h6 by the way but but she could be in trouble rook h6 is not a human move at all and that move is given about half a pawn better for white, where the others are about a fifth of a pawn, 0.2. So uh, yeah, so it's honestly not as much as you would expect between these decisions, but a6 and bishop d7 keep the status quo in terms of the evaluation, even though, of course, they change the position quite a lot. Yes, 
and uh well big moment for humpy there will she play bishop to d7 will she allow all those tactical complications i don't know it's a brave decision shall we go back to the bird's eye view and uh pop in on the other games because there have been some interesting developments in the game between Mizichik and Leighton J. Okay. Whoa. Yeah, the pieces are just gone. So suddenly it went from a position where we were talking about the White King being in some danger because of all those pieces. How many pawns is Mizichik up? Two at the moment, right? Two, but uh, not for long. <laughs> One of those pawns will at least disappear from those balls. So which one would you take? Queen takes d5, rook takes b2. I feel like I would take b2 just because queen takes d5 loses sight of the c7 pawn. And uh, what's tricky about this position, before I actually want to dive into the moves, I think what's tricky when you look at this game as a spectator and you see the engines is 0.00. .00. So what that means to me, is that there's a possibility at some point of, say, rook b4 takes g4 and making a draw by repetition, or they're like end games where the engine assesses them as equal, even if there's an extra pawn for one side, but at a human level, we're like, I don't want any part of that. So for example, if white loses these two pawns that have highlighted on d5 and b2, and black loses c7, maybe the engine says, that's just even. But we're like, White's up a pawn. Why should this just be a draw? I don't see the attack against the White King. So Ivanka, I don't know if you agree with me, but those are just some thoughts I have swirling in my head that this looks far from just zeros. It looks like there's a ton of life left in this game. And I actually think that Lei Ting Zhe has a little bit more to prove at the moment than does Muzi Zhu. Yes, you know, when it comes to this type of position where there's just heavy pieces on the board, I always like to judge them on two factors. So first up, it will be on king safety. If one side's king is a little bit unsafe, then you have to be a little bit cautious. And secondly, it's peace activity. And as you can see, Anna Mizuchuk, she's very active with her queen, but her king is a little bit exposed. So as you mentioned, she is vulnerable to potential sacrifices on G4. And then it comes to the question of peace activity. Now, Lei, by my rule, should be playing rook takes b2 because you want to be activating all of your pieces. You want to go rook to b2, and then you want to be rounding up against the d5 pawn, or you want to activate your rook on e8, maybe by going e4, e3, just to amplify white's safety concerns with their king. So I I feel that this is a dynamically balanced game as opposed to one that is just like zero, 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 no life left in the position. And well, queen takes d5, commentator's curse. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually agree with you though. I thought taking on b2 was a move that I would have gone for because let's say white plays b3. Yes. White is up a pawn and this queen will slide back to e3 before you can push a pawn there or attack my h3 pawn. And I do believe that Lei Tingji has a ton to prove. And one more note, um, Yvanka, and I wonder if you agree with this, because you have been commenting the last few days. This sort of has some resemblance to the game that Anand Muzichuk just played against Katarina Lakno. And in that game, it was Lakno's king that was in trouble. But we had a position that the engines like towards the middle, towards the middle, great, everything's being held. But it was super tricky, and you needed to find some only moves at critical junctures. And I feel like black is in some danger here after a move like b3, because if white's able to stabilize, black is just down a pawn. Totally. And the thing that really catches my attention about this particular position is after the move b3, you want to hold on to the b2 pawn. But if the queens get swapped off for whatever reason, then in a rook and pawn ending, it's going to be very beneficial for white to have the better pawn structure. So you can see here that how the evaluation bar goes all the way up in white's favor, primarily because of black's weak pawns, the weak pawn on c7, and also the possibility that white has of just, just marching the king over to the queen side and then just advancing the a pawn. I... So that's why I'm surprised by queen takes d5. 
And as you mentioned, white does have that beautiful resource of dropping the queen all the way back to e3. Remember, you've got to do some repair work when your king is unsafe. You need your queen to always protect her king. Yep. Something just like this. And the A and B pawns connected, protected, and extra, one of them. So this could be dangerous for Lei Tingji. Uh, some end games, even with level material, could be dangerous because of the presence of an outside pass pawn. I'm just going to sort of force this uh, for a second. So uh, let me try to figure out how to do this. Let's say queen b7, and we get a trade. Even positions like this, I know I'm giving away this b3 pawn. Uh, some, maybe not this specific one, could be dangerous for black because of the presence of an outermost pass pawn. So I'm just trying to keep uh, certain options available. I think the players, sometimes they bank on these ideas that I'm in a risk-free position. I'm the one who can press without any risk even if I lose my extra material. But for now, I don't see why Anna Musichuk has to think about giving up her pawn. It's extra. This rook is coming to e1. This rook may come to c1. Ivanka, are we overstating the case, or do you believe that Lei Tingji could be in danger here? Well, I, I'm, I've been lucky to commentate on a, quite a few of Lei's games, and so I'm beginning to understand her style. I'm thinking that what she wants to do is she wants to be playing c5 in this position. So okay. she wants to cut off the queen's retreat to e3. To so therefore, she, she wants to go queen to f3. She wants her queen sniffing around the white king, and then she's going to back that up with moves like e4, e3, attack. I like the thought of that for sure. I, I guess... Because the white queen is so sidelined, at this kind of move, c5, you are shutting it out, making sure it does not get back to this critical e3 square. And perhaps white will bring a rook there instead, but that queen does feel like it's offside and not participating in the critical part of the board. I, I actually really like that move, c5. I acknowledge I wasn't looking in that direction. So no, c5, neither was I. It looks like a really, really smart move. I, I like that a lot. And I think white probably has to bring the rook to e3 and the evaluation bar, the engine, says zeros. I think there's so much left to be played in this position. And I just think that because of the extra pawn and the lack of a clear attack, at least for now, I do believe that Lei Tingji just has a bit more to prove. But if anyone can do it, it's certainly her. We know uh, how strong she is, how well she's been playing I mean, coming into this event. Uh, she's had a lot of time to prepare, and it hasn't started the way she wanted. But if she can actually get an attack going in this game, maybe she could even turn it completely in her favor if Anna Muzicic is not careful. But I do believe she will be. Yes. Still, very dynamically balanced game. I'm quite looking forward to seeing how that one will conclude. You know, earlier on, I did ask everyone to make their predictions. And I just realized even from the all four positions on the board, I cannot tell you. Who will be <laughs> winning or who do I feel is better? But uh, anyhow, let's go back to the bird's eye view and have a look at some of the other games in progress. And just to quickly point out that in the game between Salimova and Humpy, Humpy did play bishop to d7, knight to b5 is on the board. So we are going to be in for a slugfest there. Maybe we can uh, have a look at the game between uh, Goryashkina and Vaishali. We haven't checked in on them in a long time. Let's go there. And as we tune into this game, I'm not going to make you or anybody pick specific winners, but I am curious to ask chat and everyone watching how many decisive games you think there will be. That's a nice way of doing this. That way you don't feel pressured to pick specific games. All of them are unclear. And I guess, Yvanka, I, I can answer the question first myself or I could pass it to you. But I guess the, I'm trying to get at how many decisive games do you think we'll see this round? Um, one, two, two, two. I'm going to go out. <laughs> okay, you're going to go with two. I am looking at the games. I'm going to go. I also wanted to go with two. I'm going to join you. It's going to be a bit of a chorus here. Uh, two decisive games. I don't know which two they'll be. It could be this one, even though the engine is in the middle. But as we look at the specifics here, the bishop did get to e4. The dark square bishop for white is gone for a knight. Still this isolated pawn. So Yvonne, at first glance, we could see the evaluation bar ever so slightly prefers white. 
how about you? Do you think that you would prefer to play from the white side or maybe you'd prefer to play it from black? No, I would definitely prefer to play from the white side. I feel the trouble is now over for Goryashkina and she will be feeling very, very comfortable with her position. Now it's just a case of uh, trying to take control over the C line. Maybe just go rook to C3, rook to C1, and then just double up and play for that. Just leave that tension with the minor pieces there in the center and just focus on improving the rooks. Unless I'm missing something obvious from Vaishali, I don't think that she has a plan. It's a really good idea from the white side. And I was about to ask you, and you answered before I could even get there. So you preempted it. I was going to say, if black had a free turn, I like to play this game where I'm like, if my opponent has a free turn and you know they're not stealing all my pieces, this isn't Pac-Man. If you have a free turn, what is the actual plan? I know if my opponent played Bishop G2, I take back. I don't feel scared of that. So if I handed Vaishali a free move, Ivanka, help me out. What do you think she would actually play? I was thinking knight c4. That looks annoying. <laughs> although, it, although it doesn't actually have any concrete point other than attacking the pawn on a3. It closes down the c file, and you just mentioned how white wants to double on it. So that yeah. actually is a really good point. So any other move candidates if you gave black a free turn besides uh, knight c4, or in addition to, I should say? Um, queen a4. Also looks pretty annoying. This A3 pawn. I think we figured out uh, the issue for white is A3 pawn is a bit tender and there may not be an attack on the king side so we can give up on that from black's perspective but go after this A3 pawn. I like what you're suggesting and that helps inform what maybe I should do from the white side. And one more thing I'm actually my eye is on but I, I don't know. There is this D file and there's a queen here. So bishop takes yeah. E4 D takes zero. That scares me. I think we should put it on the board, and it's the engine says point two better for white. But how could you not be worried about some discovery when a rook stares down against a queen? Yes. Well, I, I would be worried for white <laughs> just because, and just because you know the bishop on G two was such a fantastic defender. And now there are vulnerable light squares. Yeah, you can see queen coming to h3. And there's a strong square for the knight on f3. So you can all see all sorts of tactical possibilities involving maybe a potential rook takes knight one day. So I would never in a million years go bishop takes e4. No, would not touch I'll... it at all. I'm going to get an assist from the engine because this does look very promising for black. It says the move here is knight c6, which actually makes perfect sense because you're unleashing oh. your rook against the black queen. And the whole point actually is that if you just sidestep, you're giving up an entire rook here. And yet the computer doesn't even want to take it because it's saying that for knight takes rook, queen h3 is devastating with the knight coming to f3, your exact point. And that's unstoppable. You'll give up your queen and still get checkmated. So the computer is suggesting that white should take on e5 and all of that fancy business for a knight trade. Yes. But if you see that, you've actually changed the pawn structure. Before you had a long term pressure against the isolated queen's pawn, the IQP. In this particular structure, nothing. Yeah, you fixed it. Now, this would be exactly. Just equality. So that's not exactly what uh, Goryashkina would want to go for. So what the one thing that caught my eye, because first I, my initial impression was just double up on the sea line, but then I thought, how about just uh, moving the knight back? To where? To b3. Aha. Now yeah. I realize I... that this might just be a one trick wonder because I'm threatening knight to c5, attacking the queen, attacking the bishop. And I Hmm. It looks like a very reasonable choice. And I my first re reaction is to go queen f5, just to go after the white king if you're going to leave with your knight. And I would be very scared of some kind of check here or yeah. bishop f3 or trading bishops. The white king feels a bit alone, right? 
it, it, it does feel alone. I wouldn't allow a, a piece to come into F3. Well, we have a decision from Goryashkina. She just went B5. Ooh. Ooh, it makes a lot of sense. Carving out squares. Her knight would like to recapture and get your rook c7 involved. Are there any... My first question to that, though, is what happens after a takes b5? Okay. You're asking me how I take back? I, I think yes. either way, but I'll take with the knight for now. Okay. And... Here, I was wondering whether there are any flashy moves like knight to f3 check. Ooh, just trying to trade everything off. Let's see. Knight yes. F3. Takes. But ta I think it might fail. Rick, I was thinking rook c7. Uh, to go after the f7 pawn? But yeah. what if black just... Uh, I see your point. The rook d7. This is actually very deep and also instructive for everyone watching that... Sometimes you get to a position like this and you say oh, rook d7, we trade, and then d5 collapses. I think rook f8 is also possible. It looks much better for white. I would, I think anyone would take this from the white side. And yet the engine is unbothered saying 0.4, not even uh, close to a pawn better for white. And I'm, I think what you and I, Ivanka, and, and I hope that many people in our audience start thinking this way, is that if we can trade a pair of rooks and the queens, and black loses these two pawns for just the one white pawn. This is a theoretical draw of rook and four against rook and three on the same side of the wood. That's, I know, hard for people to visualize. So I'm going to force it. And I'm sorry, Ivanka, for going down a very long path here. But I'm just going to try to force that issue somehow. Uh, let's see. How can I do this? Let's say, okay, I think I know how. Just go this way. Trade off. Trade, trade, trade. And so that way they don't have to visualize. They can just see it on their screens, that this position, the engine knows is a theoretical draw, completely even, despite the fact that white is up a pawn. And players like Garrick Kasparov have lost this when they are down a pawn. But still, we know this is a theoretical draw, Ivanka. Yeah, we, it is a theoretical draw, but it's a very difficult draw, as you mentioned. I've uh, had it in practice as well, and I won with the, with the four <laughs> points, that is. <laughs> But um, yeah, no, it's a very interesting decision there from Goryashkina. We've actually noticed this a lot in the games that rather than sit and wait and maneuver in slowly improving the position, that the players have tended to go for immediate action. Do you think this is a sign of nerves or just a stylistic choice? It depends on the player. I think some players really struggle to sit and wait and anticipate, They're, they get antsy, they need some activity of their own. And other players, they may try to seize the moment where they may recognize that their opponent isn't comfortable. And Vaishali, at times throughout her admittedly young career, but she's still growing as a chess player, uh, she's gotten herself into some serious time trouble. And that plays a part in results. And yesterday she was on the winning side of a game where her opponent aired in uh, some serious time trouble but Vaishali right now 21 minutes 16 moves you do have that 30 second bonus time with every move made but we're getting into that territory where you may make a quick decision and then regret it because it gives away some key squares or even a pawn so I think that for Goyashkina she's not really risking much with her decision so I think it was a smart move to push that pawn to b5 Yes, and on that note, I think it's the time to take a short break because when we come back, we are going to be there commentating all the action on those crunch time moments, so you don't want to miss it. Three sisters smashed chess's greatest records, and it all started with an experiment. Their father, Laszlo Polger, believed that anyone could be a genius, and he set out to prove it with his three daughters. At an early age, the eldest, Susan, showed an affinity for both chess and math, but her passion was at the chessboard. Susan became the best female chess player in the world by age 15. Their father nurtured his daughter's gift, and when it came time, he taught chess to both of Susan's sisters as well. Before they were even teenagers, Susan Sophia and Judah Polger became world-renowned for their exceptional chess skill. At age 15, Judah Pulgar became the youngest person to achieve a Grandmaster title, an incredible chess record which had been held by Bobby Fischer for 34 years. 
Judah quickly climbed the ranks in chess, mercilessly destroying grandmaster opponents and gaining victories and accolades. She became the number seven player in the world, reaching a peak rating of 2735 and defeated 11 world champions, including Garry Kasparov. At Rome in 1989, Sofia made history with an incredible 2900 rating performance, one of the best ever recorded to that date. She later decided to pursue other avenues in chess, but according to Laszlo, she had the most talent. These three sisters defied the norms at the time and became champions. To this day, they fight for equality in chess and continue to inspire the next generation. I try to be the person to help kids learn chess and through chess to be more successful in life. The Polgars left a legacy both on the board and in the world. Has this ever happened to you? Oh shoot, another mouse slip. What about this? Oh, well holy bishops on passant. I think I'm getting carpal tunnel. If only there was a way to play online chess with a real life board. What if I told you, you can with Chess Up 2. That's right, with Chess Up 2, you can now play over the board online. Wow. Simply connect your chess.com account to our state-of-the-art Chess Up 2 and get a game started. Every time you move, our revolutionary board will transmit the data online directly to your opponent. And as soon as they move, squares will light up, signifying which piece is going where. Well, shucks. This Hikaru guy seems pretty good. With Chess Up 2, mm. mouse slips and sore wrists mm. are a thing of the past. My carpal tunnel is gone. Well, this sure is fun. I'm playing online against my new friend Hikaru. Who needs a family? But I sure do miss clicking on a piece and seeing all of my available moves, like they have on chess.com. Well, Danny, you're in luck. This feature is totally available on the Chess Up 2 as well. Wow, well, I'm convinced. But hey, what if I don't just want to play an opponent online? What if I want to use one of chess.com's other great tools? I thought you'd never ask. With Chess Up 2, you can fully take advantage of the chess.com integration by playing bots, analyzing your offline games, and even using our optional AI assistance to visualize the quality of moves with color-coded hints. Well, holy Chess Up, you did it. You made IRL Chess cool again. You got it, Danny. And how do you know my name? Play chess today on the board of tomorrow. We are back, round four of the women's candidates, and this is the time when things begin to sharpen up. 
it is the moment when the clock starts ticking down and the pressure starts to mount. So Robert, during the break, we got very excited, didn't we, looking at the bird's eye view and looking at all the positions, so much so we weren't quite sure which position to actually check out first. But where do you think we should be going? I know where we probably won't go is the bottom left because I do think Vaishali has done a really good job of stabilizing for now against Goryachkina. Of course, we will check in that later. But I'm really fascinated by both the top left where Ten Zhang Yi, she included this D5 push. It was a pawn sacrifice. But I think we'll have to dive deeply in there. But before we do, maybe we go to the bottom right, if that's okay, Ivanka, because Anna Muzichuk still is up a pawn. I think it's a critical moment in that game. It test certainly is. We did see the evaluation bar shoot up in White's favor because Lady J's last move, which is Queen to D3, is not considered the best move. But the question is why? Let's uh, have a look at what White can be playing now. Because we have privy, you know, access to the evaluation bar, we can understand that actually there are possibilities here that maybe we'd discount just off the back of our heads because they just look so outrageous so because of the valuation bar the first move that i would consider is just queen takes pawn and i'm going to give and you a ton of credit yvanka and I'm, I'm you're very modest uh you are super polite but during the break we were talking about this just going back and forth and yvanka spotted what i think is a brilliant idea so i'm giving you a shout out you deserve it queen takes c5 giving up the pawn very close to the white king which is super difficult and i love the follow-up that you suggested so i'll let you say it because i certainly was not aiming in this direction yeah it, it was uh you need to defend the g4 pawn so i was suggesting rook to e4 why use one piece when you can use two pieces in the defense rook e4 with the idea of just dropping back the queen to e3 and then just getting on with active operations i I think this is, I would never ever spot this in a game. And, you know, with the role that I'm in as a commentator, I can suggest moves that may get me checkmated and then say, okay, that didn't work. I was just trying to explain to you why it wasn't happening. But this rookie four move, I really, really like that because oftentimes stopping one square short of a move that we may expect is difficult. And rookie four defends. I love your idea with queen e3. And we do have pass pawns on the queen side that can start pushing because the white king isn't getting checkmated, at least not anytime soon. So this looks promising for Anna Musichuk. She doesn't even need to go for this specific variation. Others also look nice for her, but I like this rookie four move so much and felt that I had to show it. Yeah. And uh, is this one significantly better than the other moves available to her? Instead of uh, rookie four or even before queen takes c5? It, it, queen takes c5 because i'm i'm just curious because i'm thinking on a practical level queen c5 might be like the one chance she has because if she doesn't do that then we're going to see a position where lei is pretty active with her own pieces and there's going to be that dynamic balance again there's no clear illustration of what you're talking about than the second best suggestion of rook takes e5. And let's say we <laughs> trade here. It's saying that white should go queen g3, which makes sense. But at yeah. this point, the activity that you just spoke about, rook a3, a lovely concept. It's blockading white's pass pawn. And at some moment, you can flick in c4 to go after white's king side. And you see the eval bar off the side suggesting that black is hardly worse here. Double isolated G pawns, a very active rook for black, a passive rook for white. And white's not in danger of, you know, at all, of course, but it seems that black will be able to strike with a C4 push at the right time, first probably bringing the king towards the center. Yeah, and uh, again, these are gutsy, gutsy moves, you know, to take that pawn on c5, take that pawn on e5 in the live board. You've got to be actively neglecting your king side, something that the human brain is not necessarily conditioned to do. So this is an exciting moment for Anna Muzichuk. Will she hold her nerve and capture one of those pawns? Well, we'll find out. But let's go back to the bird's eye view because other games are getting spicy. And she did it, by the way. Look at, look at 
Wow, in the bottom right, Anamushik took queen takes d5. So your spot during the break became true. It came to fruition, and she has given up her kingside pawn to take another one on the queen side. So that game uh, promises to be exciting, and it already has been. But I think it makes sense to go to Tan Zhang Yi's game as she entered the round as the clear leader. And that game is certainly heating up after it was a strategic battle at first. Yes. Wow. So D5 has been played by Tang Zhongyi. And let me just quickly count the material. Well, white is a pawn up and it is black to play. So should we guess? Should we rewind really quickly, Ivanka, you think? Yes, to... please. Okay. So I think we left around here where black doubled and white defended. And you might get at least at first glance, it looks a bit awkward. And bishop to c4, what do you make of that decision from Tan Zhang Yi? It's, just, it's again, it's very intriguing because I wouldn't necessarily be conditioned to find that move because I would want to keep that light square bishop as a defender of the d5 square. So knight takes bishop, presumably yes. played. The rook took back and then rook to b3 was the follow-up to defend the loose pawn and i think we're gonna have to zoom forward a little bit yeah bishop d2 to protect the knight and only now d5 opening up the bishop the rook is active on c4 but it is a pawn sacrifice so at first as we get up to speed yvanka at first glance here do you like what you've been seeing from tan Zhang Yi? yes i do i felt it was a little bit miserable position for Tan just to sit there and wait. She needs to break out. She needs to do something, activity over everything. So I love what she's doing. That's the only way that she's going to create chaos and just mix things up. And now she went knight to f6 with a threat of e4, just forking the queen and the bishop. So got to do something about that. She Now she drops the queen back to f1. <laughs> yes, and earlier uh, was not played, and Black could take a C2 pawn. That one mm -hmm. is hanging. I think that uh, was not actually as free as it looks because White has this lovely move, Rook C3, and I don't think we have enough pieces on the C file, but all of these heavy pieces are here, and I think White wins this battle with this extra, or I should say not extra, but pass pawn on D5 and some pressure on the Queen side. So I think Queen D7, another move showing restraint she goes after the d5 pawn she goes after the a4 pawn Ivanka I love the way she is handling this position it is beautifully played let's face it I, I like the way that she keeps upping the pressure against Katarina and you're right it's decision time and decision time is gonna cost Katarina you know time on the clock which pawn do you let go you have to let go of something I think I would preserve the A pawn. I feel that the D5 pawn, whatever happens in life, is not long for the world. <laughs> but it yeah, also this... might be the C2 pawn that falls. Hang on a second. <laughs> we have three pawns that are vulnerable. And I am not sure either. That's oof, challenging call at this moment for white because you could play C3. That way you defend that C pawn, but you do drop A4 and your rook is loose over here and D5 doesn't feel like it's surviving that much longer anyway. The challenge at this stage for Katarina is making the right call, but I would say, Ivanka, something I've overlooked, look at Black's clock. 13 minutes, 30 seconds for 14 moves. I know they get that bonus time with each move played, but this is where you start to speed up and you could speed up at the wrong moment and pay the price. Yes. Oh, it's it's a very, very tricky position for both players, but I suspect that Katarina now is going to burn a lot of time on the clock because there are problems to be faced in the position. Yes, I know Tan Zhong Yi is a little bit in time trouble, but her plan is relatively clear. But I just, sorry, I just can't get over this queen to d7 move. What a beautiful shot. You know, she wasn't thinking about you know, forcing the matter with e4, like I was, she was just thinking, let me just try to maximize my pieces. Queen to d7, attack a4, attack d5, attack c2, threaten e4, keep white guessing. It's, 
it's just beautiful. And I've, it's just beautiful. So now I have to put on my logical cap and think, okay, how to handle this as white. The full and, board awareness. That's I think the name of the game right here and on full display. So you asked the question, how to handle this from white. I'm going to ask you, how should white handle this? What's your okay, logical cap idea. telling you? Rook okay. E3. It's telling Ooh. me to do this weird move. Rook E3. Go on the counter offensive because you kind of, you said you wanted to play C3 and I was like, yes, yeah, C3 would be the perfect like reparatory move, but you don't want to be leaving your rook on b3. So has the evaluation bar like dropped significantly down? Let's see. Not significantly. It goes just towards the middle. So it says uh -huh. that whatever small advantage white might have had, perhaps it's because the b4 pawn drops. So I'll give you e5. I'll take b4 and a4. So it will be even material and truly anyone's game at that stage. I don't, I, rookie three is a completely logical move to my eyes. Yeah. Yeah, it was just in a desperate attempt to just repair the pawn structure. So, um, other moves, bishop e2, bishop e3. Oh. I don't, oh. I'll be honest with you, I don't know. Too <laughs> many decisions. <laughs> every move that you've, sorry, I was going to say, Yvonne, every single move you suggested is like natural. And so that's why these positions take so much time and you will see players as strong as Katarina Lucknow no, sit in for a deep think because we just mentioned C3, Rook E3, Bishop E3, Bishop E2. I can't even count how many moves it. I think four different moves that we've suggested and all of them look perfectly playable. So I'm with you in the I don't know camp. I, I believe that all of those moves make perfect sense to me. And I don't know what I would choose if I were sitting across from Tan Zhang Yi. I have one idea that I'd like to throw at you. Bishop e2, before we move on, I'd love to throw bishop e2 because I just spotted right. that uh, after rook takes c2, you can go bishop takes a6. Ah. Now, I, I might be giving up the whole house. But you're getting the house too. So potentially. D5 is loose. Can I? I can take something because this rook on b3 is also under attack. Uh, I guess I'll take this one. It looks more forcing as this bishop is pressured. This rook and you take my rook. I take yours and I says slightly better for black somehow. But we have a move. C3 indeed played. I, I suggest that really only out of how do I protect as many pawns at the same time. But d5 can be captured. Ivanka, a4 can be captured. This is what I was saying, that where time plays such a big part. Ten Zhang Yi is down to nearly 13 minutes, and you can make a quick decision. It might be the wrong one, and then you get in trouble. Yep. Oh, well, critical moment there for both players. Shall we go back to the bird's eye view? Because I can also see things heating up in the game between uh salim well it's not heating up it's always been spicy <laughs> salimova against humpy i think that's the best choice and part of the reason why in addition to the king lack of safety and all the tactics we've seen as far they're on move 18. they have 13 minutes left which means they have 22 moves to make with the time they have on their clock plus the 30 seconds they get for every move. But this is the exact type of position where you blunder into a checkmate. You just lose to some kind of tactic that you overlooked. Ivanka, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Would you rather have the black or white side of this position where neither king feels safe? Um, actually, I'm not sure now because I felt Salimova perhaps played it a little bit too slowly with a uh, rook to d. If we were to rewind, I was a big fan of my own suggestion of going bishop to d6. So knight to b5, I loved. And then here I really wanted to just take the tactical matters into my own hands and go bishop to d6. I feel that that would Which... have been a, sh a little bit of a shock for Humpy. But if because this wasn't played and now we go rook to d1 instead and now queen to b g6 and here 
There's no porn breakthrough whatsoever. Because as you highlighted earlier on, if white steps up with d5, the knight gets access to the e5 square. If you try to break through with e4, well then the d4, oh, I was going to say the d4 pawn is vulnerable and it is vulnerable. Is e4 anything? I feel like a6 is going to, yeah, of course. that's why you paused there. You were like, oh, the knight on b5 is not really on a stable square so at some point maybe even yeah. in that current position a6 just kicking that exactly out. and you can and the point is you can never ever challenge with d5 which is ultimately the move you want to be playing to stick just activate the rooks so i'm thinking if g5 is not possible then you've got to conduct your attack with your pieces so how to do that i don't have the answer I thought that might have been a rhetorical, or at least I was hoping that it was a rhetorical question because mm -hmm. this is such a complex position. And we've been talking for now two minutes, and I look at the clock, Nergil Salamova, 10 minutes, 40 seconds, time is ticking. And this is when you lash out. I've done this so many times myself. I make, oh, D4 is protected for now. This looks interesting. I might play E5. You see the engine actually stays in the middle. So Ivanka, your suggestion is not bad, yeah, but this kind of position looks very scary totally looks scary as well and you're probably gonna, gonna have to make like counter-attacking moves like either e takes f5 or e5 in order to survive but again very very double-edged so the only thing that i can think of is you're going to be attacking with pieces one move that i don't want to be playing is queen to f4 because then i feel that it invites oh the knight has come back to c3 wow okay which so Sorry, which, uh, what do you yeah, think? Yeah, no, about it's just, it just also indicates that Salimova is coming to the same conclusion. So maybe she wants to, I don't know, reroute the knight to f4. And uh, you have to bear in mind that, uh, yes, the black queen and rook can line up on the h line, but the king is perfectly safe on f2. And then white can start taking over the initiative, which suddenly gives me the inspiration that maybe you should be going king f2 in book h1. Wow, that's actually very okay. clever and I think strong. Yeah, but it's maybe too creative. No, I think I'm going to go back and move before knight c3 and see what the king f2 is the best move in this position instead of knight c3. Okay. That's what the engine's saying. Okay, they're very little between them but king f2 is a very very strong idea you're bringing that rook on to h1 and you're trying to compete for this open file rather than suffer uh, from your opponent's rook so great call by you ivanka rook coming to h1 was helpful and if that's the case does black have an opportunity to take advantage of what's seemingly some waffling about yeah it's still a very tricky position because whilst Humpy has perfectly placed her pieces in a defensive way, they're not aggressively placed. So I can't come up with a plan. And uh, if King F2 is a good move, then there's no point in going Queen to H6 because you're, you're literally encouraging White to find the correct plan. So what to do? I King, think I, King I like your earlier move, Yvonne. King, oh, King of seven. I, I was also thinking about that, yeah. but only because you said King to F2. And <laughs> let me look. King of seven is one of the top moves, but the move I was going to suggest before I even like, clicked on the moves is E5. I think that Black yeah. wants to be active, needs to be active. I am worried, I'll be honest, about Knight hopping into D5. And that does concern me, but I don't know how concerned I really should be because anytime this Knight here, takes this bishop on f6, I can take with the g-pawn and open up some potential pressure. So I'm combining king f7 ideas with e5. I don't know if they'll work very well because I'm opening up the light squares, but I think your king f7 move is one we might just see. Yes. The thing is about the move e5, it's something that you suggest in analysis and you don't have the nerve to play in real life because you are breaking the rules, right? When the king stands in the middle of the board, you're not meant to accelerate play. Um, what has she played? King f7. She definitely king just F7. played king f7. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Ivanka, you're inspiring me and everybody watching, but also the players, they can't hear you, but they feel inspired with your ideas. And I liked your idea from White, by the way, Knight to E2. Knight E2, uh, I think that's a, yeah. The Knight did its job on B5. I, I want to point out just very, ever so quickly, the Knight on B5, it wasn't a waste because by bringing the Rook to C8, it prevented Black from casting. Again, that was your idea from earlier, Ivanka. And now that the Knight's done its job, it returns C3, E2, and up to F4. And I do believe that White is stabilizing on the King side. Yes. Oh, oh, very spicy game already. Okay. Oh, um, the player's playing very quickly and the knight does come to E2. You know, one of the, the funniest things that ever happened to me on, I think my second ever commentary job, I was very happy. I guessed all of the moves that the players were making. And then I, I went back to my hotel room and I was pleased as punch. I was like, look at me, I'm such a great player. <laughs> And then, and then I went and analyzed them with a computer and literally every move that I had suggested was a blunder. And the players had just <laughs> <laughs> had also blundered as well. So there you go. Uh, I was impressed. <laughs> well, I, I think at this stage of the round, we are bound to see some blunders unless the players can keep the pace because we're looking at the clocks in this game uh, they're under 10 minutes at least humpy is at the moment with so many moves to make and i'm looking at the corner of my eye at the tan Zhang Yi game she's in first place but she's herself is under 10 minutes and if i'm not mistaken the evaluation is changing in that game oh. as well so i don't know if you want to jump there yeah let's, Ivanka, let's but... dive in let's follow let's... the action so what's happening in that game Tan Zhong Yi, two and a half points out of three. She is the tournament leader. Her queen. What is her queen doing over there on A2? It took a pawn, but then it went into enemy territory. Oh. Oh, is, is, is the queen on the verge of getting trapped? I'm looking for the same stuff. I'm wondering the same thing. I'm thinking Rook A1. Yes, we'll, how can we'll how can back. one even trap the queen? But you've always got Bishop E2 and grab on A6. That's that's the most materialist brain just <laughs> <laughs> working. I I like that. Rook A1, Rook takes A6. Bishop E2, Bishop takes A6. The point is that that A6 pawn is in trouble, and this queen it will survive, but at what cost? I mean, Black has deserted her queen side. Mm -hmm. I totally, no, you don't do this. You don't put your queen out there on no man's land. And she's yeah. down to about seven minutes, Ivanka. Katarina has been playing at a great pace, 20 minutes on her clock to just seven for black with 11 moves to make. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, it's actually Tan's move. So the queen isn't in imminent danger just yet, but there is a threat of rook to a1, bishop to e2. The a pawn is gonna be hanging, so time to deal with that. And what does she play? Rook to rook. c7. So she's just allowing rook a1, and I don't know what's gonna take on a6, but this queen can join in. Isn't just a free pawn at this stage? Yes. It looks that way. Yeah, okay, let's just do it. Rook to A1. How many moves are there? They're on move 29. I, I, Is she I like banking it. on E4? So Rook A1, Queen, where's the safest place for my Queen? I'm not sure, Robert. Queen to B3, Queen to... <laughs> <laughs> queen to C7. Let's just put the Queen on C7. Okay, so I'm going to take on A6. And you're thinking e4 if i yes so oh hang on a rook second a... i might be trapping two... i'm trapping my own queen no i think rook a2 you have queen b3 and you slither away that's fortunate yes so the queen does get out maybe this is not as easy for white to anticipate because d5 looks like it's going to fall next this is challenging yes Yes, but uh, it's it's very worrying position, right, for Tan Zhong Yi. That pawn on d5 is massive. And you can... 
are you sure that I, I don't have any tactical possibilities? Like I'm also thinking D6 is in the Ooh. air. Definitely to give up that pawn and sort of put Black's pieces on vulnerable squares. Now that I'm looking at it and it helps when you have the evaluation for other sides, plus two which means that you must have a move that keeps everything together. And perhaps it's just bishop g4, because black doesn't have time to take the pawn on d5, as the rook is loose back here. And if you take the bishop that's threatening you, then my d5 pawn lives. There's a rook that is very happily placed behind it. b6 is loose, mm -hmm. and black's position crumbles. Wow. Wow. Yeah, bishop to g4. What a beautiful move. And okay, so... That looks incredibly convincing. So going back to the position, you can't quite go. You just have to do this. It's white yeah. to play. Rook A1. Queen A6. Black's queen side is just falling apart. And after E4, you just meet that by attacking the rook on C8. Beautiful. I think that idea is much easier to spot when you get to the position, but from a distance, this bishop g4 idea is quite obscure. So Katarina is doing the right thing by spending her time here, um, and she's got time to use. So why not double, triple check, try to come up with the correct responses? Because other players are not so fortunate to have all this time. Yeah. Every game is down to the wire. Totally. So shall we leave this game? Yeah, why not? And we? Uh, go back to the bird's eye view because I can also see that things have sharpened up consider considerably in the game between Salimova and Humpy. Salimova did orchestrate an e3, e4 pawn break. I think before we go there, which I really want to jump into, I just want to show that the game between Goryachkina and Vaishali, that looks like it's about to end any moment now. Uh, those players are in a rook end game with completely even material. So great job from Vaishali uh, to hold everything together. Yeah, there we can uh, see three pawns on both sides of the board and the players, how many moves have they made? Uh, they are at move number 33. So they are just a couple moves away. They must be, it's one of these positions where you have rook and three against rook and three. I don't know how much longer you really want to play this. Yes, but uh, the thing is the players are not allowed to offer draws until they pass move 40. So they have to orchestrate a three move repetition. <laughs> and <laughs> it's very important now that you make eye contact with your opponent and that you're mm. both on the same wavelength. So we do see g6 being played by Vaishali. How to get this uh, threefold repetition? Some sort of king f3, king g7, king f, you know, king whatever, back and forth. I feel like that's the simplest way, but you're right. You do need to make that eye contact because otherwise they think, oh, are you really going to make me play this out to bear kings? So she establishes okay. the pawn chain, which I think is just good technique, even if it's completely mm -hmm. drawn. But I, I just can't imagine this going on much longer. But the hand movement from Goryashkina, the way that she's playing it, just signifies that she is mentally chalked up this game to a draw. They're not even bothering to think anymore. There you go. She's put her rook back on oh, this time B5. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the best things about not being able to offer a draw. <laughs> you have to start becoming an expert on reading body language and all the signals king to F6. I'm expecting rook, rook A5. I was gonna say rook b6, like rook b6, king g7, rook b5, king f6, yeah, yeah. that repetition. Oh, she, no, she I think she went, rook went for five. rook a5. Look, she's saying, look, let's repeat. Oh no, <laughs> Vaishali is not playing. Is she? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay, maybe, maybe we'll now, get rook a6. We'll, yes, I was thinking the same thing. Rook a6, rook d6, rook a5, rook d5, and draw by following the rook. Yeah. Okay. This is so so funny that they haven't actually just. Oh, here we go. No, no, rig me fire again. Okay. <laughs> this play along, Vaishali. You gotta go king to f6. There you go. King f6. Good. 
this is the repetition for sure. Rook a5, king e6. Yeah, here we go. Yeah. Great result, though, for Vaishali. There we go. Yeah, ex excellent result there with the draw with the black pieces. And uh, she ends the day with two points out of four. Remember, tomorrow it is a rest day. Goreshkina, though, she is on a two and a half points out of four. No, she's not on two and a half, but she's on three points out of four. My apologies. No, you're correct. Two and a half. She uh, entered with two, uh, Goryachkina. So uh, she has yeah. two and a half. Point. Yeah, you were good. So, yeah, two and a yeah, half. These... Okay. <laughs> you know, the, the players, uh, you know, sometimes it seems like they've left points on the table. But for Vaishalia, I think a great recovery. And this game here, what a matchup between Nergul Selimova and Humpy Kuneru. And I think... Whoever loses this game, if there is indeed a decisive one, Yvanka, they're going to be upset. Because look at them. They're going for each other. White played E4, going after the Black King. And Humpy says, eh, whatever. I'm going to play G5 at long last and maybe G4 and go towards the White Monarch. Totally. And they're only on move 21. And take a look at the clock times. There you can see Humpy just under five minutes for Salimova, well, she's just under seven minutes, but the position is razor sharp. And I know the evaluation bar is in Salimova's favor, but I, when it comes to the ease of playing these positions, I don't know. It can all just turn on one move. I ignore the bar completely. As long as it doesn't say completely winning for one side, then I throw it out the window. And the reason why is because neither player knows who's better. And one of the moves you suggested earlier, King F2, that may be a great move or could be walking into the line of fire in some positions. And even a simple decision, what I'm putting that in quotes, simple, E takes F5, that might be a mistake. I'm going to just quickly make that move just to see, because I don't know. E takes F5. Black is better. That is ridiculous, right? You, you took a pawn, seemed to open up some files, and yet Black is, after taking back, is the one who has improved her position. So that is my ultimate point, that this position is so razor sharp that even those quick little decisions like a pawn capture, you can actually see uh, it backfire. So Ivanka, as Selimova gets down to five and a half minutes herself, this is so challenging to pick a side in terms of who you'd rather play from. Do you think it's easier to play from either side here? Oh, I think it's easier to play white just because white's king is marginally safer than black's. But if white is able just to consolidate the uh, d4 pawn, and I'm thinking maybe just retreating the bishop, then then I think that uh, white does have a straightforward plan of just pushing the pawns e5 and d5 and securing the long-term prospects. It's actually, what is black's plan now I come to think of it? If I... one were to make this just very careful move, bishop b2. I or... I don't know if it's F4 or G4. And the reason why yeah. F4 comes to mind is it may give black some sort of repetition potential because queen mm -hmm. h2 we've been talking about it. it's a single check the king slides the f2 but if i could get rid of this g pawn i would have accessed the h4 square as well i i'm not positive it'll work out i'm just throwing moves and hoping yeah, that totally. something sticks but again i guess the correct way to approach this type of position is to consider what black would be playing because if your plan is to go g4 then you need to have something lined up against that move or prevent it completely with moves like bishop to c1 or something. And as you move. mentioned, just accelerating the play with e takes f5, well, that seems to be favoring black. I'm suspecting on account of the fact that uh, maybe you can back that up with either e5 or e takes f5. But the position is just wild. I don't think we've seen such a crazy position in this tournament. Anything can happen. And there we see Salimova's clock is ticking down now to just under three and a half minutes. I think this is where experience really kicks in. Nergil Salimova is such a strong, talented player. But Humpy has been at the top level of the game 
for now decades. She has that wealth of experience. And look at Salomova down to about three minutes. She is trying to find an answer to this position. I liked your bishop c1. And then I thought, does it even stop g4? Black can play that anyway, giving up her queen for the white queen. So this position is razor sharp. And under three minutes is Salomova. Now, Yvonka, I have to say I'm getting quite nervous for her. Me too. And she makes a decision. What has she played? I think she put her king on f2. I like that. I think that, that I like she that spent her time too. wisely. Rook is coming to h1. She takes control of Black's active line. Oh, very gutsy move. In a great one. a high pressure situation there for Salimova. Remember, yesterday she lost a devastating game against Vaishali all to do with a miscalculation that right at the end, the last thing she wants to be doing is losing with the white pieces. Her second, it would be her second loss in a row. And now the ball is in Humpy's court. How is she going to meet white's planned rook to h1? And how quickly my mind has changed after king f2, I'm starting to like Salimova's chances. That 30 second bonus time per move, that is really essential. I mean, in the Candace tournament, they don't have that. So as soon as they're reaching their final minutes and seconds, they don't get to build up their time until the next control after move 40. So how do you respond to this? Because there is no more attack along the H file. You would like to open up the position more, but F takes E4 is a move you play. If the Black King, if I teleport it over to B8, I play that in a second. But with the Black's own King on F7, I don't really want to open up more lines. Yvanka, I really don't know. G4 feels overly committal. I don't like that. I'm not certain how Black should proceed. Well, I think the thing is you have to ask yourself what white is threatening. Is white threatening e5, then dropping the bishop back to b2, and then d5, which would be overwhelming? Is uh, is white threatening to go e takes f5, is then followed by a check on d5? Now, that wouldn't trouble me so much if I were black. And... Mm -hmm. Can you do anything against e5? If the answer is no, then you have to sharpen things up as much as possible. Maybe even swap of queens. I actually think that's a good suggestion because rook h1 does bother me. If I'm thinking about this from Humpy's perspective, uh, rook h1 forces the queen back. The queen can't go to f8 because there's a bishop there. And so she plays g4. Instead of swapping queens, she just attacks the white queen. And now it's big decision time for Nergul Salomova. Queen f4, bishop g5, traps the white queen. So don't put your mm -hmm. queen on that f4 square. You have to run away. But again, if you put it on the wrong square, the engine may say incorrect. X marks the spot. Now the advantage is in the other opponent's favor. So I, I think these are all difficult decisions. Well, she's moving her queen and she moved it over to c3. Nice nice decision there the f4 is still tightly controlled and again i'm i wow f takes oh. e4 so she was worried about white pushing e5 but f takes yeah. e4 wow well, that's playing with fire opening up the f line for the white rook on f1 to start applying pressure oh risky risky business here who's whose king is less safe is the ultimate question here because the rook on f1 is happy and black can't get a rook to f8 and well nergil she brings her king to e1 she's just trying to open up her rook against the black king and the engine did not approve ivanka it looks like a very strong practical move but apparently the engine says not the best no Maybe it might have been possible to actually grab that pawn on e4 and then argue that the king on f2 is perfectly safe from any checks. Also, there's the consequences, though, of uh, capturing on e4 and that this white knight can now sit on f4. And that's a but... nice, juicy outpost. Sharpening up so much. <laughs> but, <laughs> and then, then it's the clock situation as well because I can see Humpy's position 
you know, she's only on just over two minutes. Her king is vulnerable on F7. So maybe just tuck it over to G7. That makes perfect sense. D5 suddenly is actually quite an enormous threat. Uh, the bishop on F6 is pinned. She goes king G7. The engine doesn't love it. And that means that Nurgil Salamova oh. has a chance to take over the initiative. No, the engine hates that move. King to G7. He just, did you just see the way it shot up? The evaluation bar was not happy. But why is this move such a mistake? Is it just simply to do with bishop takes E4, knight to F4? Both of those moves look bishop good. Your e4? earlier. That, that was also bishop c1. Bringing that bishop yeah. back into the game looks very strong. This queen doesn't actually have that many safe squares to go to from h6. If you ever go to g6, then knight f4 with tempo. So I feel like you know, Humphrey's living on the edge a bit. And then I'm looking at the clocks. Both players down under two and a half minutes. It's all about the nerves. As Ivanka. They're only about to be on move 25. So many moves to make until they reach the second time patrol. Yes. <laughs> Not so much time. And I agree with you. There's so much. Bishop takes e4 played. But now there is a big threat of bishop to c1. Attacking yes. this queen and uh, threatening all sorts of tactics with rook takes bishop in the air. And now Humpy... She's just got over two minutes to come up with some defense. Bishop c1 and rook h1 are going to trap the black queen. That's sort of an odd place for the queen to get trapped, but it just doesn't have squares. And mm -hmm. for Humpy, that may lead her to try to find some resource in the position to muddy the waters, but I just am not seeing it. I think Nurgle's played an awesome game. I was worried for her early on, and then as we approach the time patrol, but uh, King F2, I should say time trouble, but King F2 to E1, really great job by her sprinting her king to more shelter. Definitely. And uh, I know that some of her moves haven't been computer approved, but on a practical level, the very, very strong Bishop E4, threatening Bishop C1, like you say, trapping the queen. Also, I just want to highlight that our ideas of Rook takes Bishop in the air, followed by D5 and Humpy about to make a move. Queen to G5. But isn't Bishop C1? I guess she wants to scurry on over to A5 and trade queens in, in this way. It doesn't look pleasant for Black, but it, with the queens off the board, she may feel like she can hold the game. Mm -hmm. I was wondering whether she could throw in Bishop takes Knight first and then Bishop C1. That's a very tricky position. She starts with bishop c1. She wants to keep her mm -hmm. bishop pair instead. And the engine hasn't budged, so a good move. Okay. Queen a5. Only move that I see. All right. And I think a queen trade is forced at this stage. That much is clear, as the white queen can't get out of the way. There's a king behind it. And Yvanka, the big question, after the queen trade, the engine seems to suggest that white has a two pawn advantage at that point, despite the material equality. Do you think it's anywhere near that simple? Because to me, I feel like black is really hanging in. Um, I think it is quite simple because the pawn on G4 is really bad. And the knight on A5, once the queen trades occur, doesn't make a great impression either. And so there we see the queens have come off the board. And I th think the resource I was relying on, rook f4 e5, opening up the bishop to the pawn is just a blunder. Because anytime yes. you play e5, the bishop on d7 is loose because of this rook on d1 staring through. So rook f4 is just winning a pawn at minimum for white. Mm -hmm. And the Black King still very, very unsafe. Rook F4 played. I'm impressed. I'm really, really impressed with how Salimova has played this game because Humpy came for her from the beginning of this game. And yes, she's been extraordinarily resilient and she's outplayed the legend that is Humpy Koneru. And she has the clear upper hand. 
I don't see how Black stays in this at this point. No, uh, once the G-Pawn falls, the Black King is going to be in tremendous trouble. And here li herein lies the problem. There's just no peace coordination whatsoever for the Black pieces. None of them are working together towards a point. Whereas Whites is the perfect harmonious situation. And there we see Rook to H7. So active Rook for Black, H2. but... It doesn't really Sorry. carry a threat. No, you're all, you're all good. We've all <laughs> said the number in the other way, but look at the evaluation bar. It's growing. It's saying that it's plus essentially three pawns for white, despite the fact that white's only up one pawn. And the reason why is the king could not run towards the center. There are going to be bishop a3 checks and things of the like. And now with the king in the corner, I'm looking at some kind of knight f4 to g6 ideas. And that black king is in a world of hurt. Yes, I was also attracted to the idea of going d5 in order to trap this knight on a5. But it was for a later stage, not for right now. It's a good reminder because I think my move knight f4 also leaves this rook vulnerable. Knight f4, e5, be very careful. Don't just rush the decision making because there is a loose rook in the sights of this big on d7 so some precision required here but salimova still about two minutes on her clock the position is simplifying and simplifying in her favor and i think mm -hmm. humpy if she survives this it's going to be because of a miracle yeah and i suspect your knight to f4 move is the killer blow though because you know they say when it comes to attack three is the magic number and once a knight jumps into g6 the king will be forced to step into the eye line of one of the pieces. And you see that Salimova, she is spending her time. She knows that she can possibly land a knockout blow, but as she approaches one minute, this is where mistakes tend to happen even after an extraordinarily well-played game. So Salimova needs to keep her cool. Very difficult. 30 moves into this game. It's about to be her 30th move, that is. And she's down to one minute. So Ivanka, in your experience, this kind of situation, time management is hard to figure out. You don't know when you should spend almost all of your clock or when you should make that immediate move. And it's not just time management because once your clock starts ticking down, the emotions just start to rise up. The heartbeat quickens and it becomes a real struggle to think clearly. And there we see Rook to G6 attacking the Bishop. A nice, safe move, getting that Rook out of the eye line of the light square Bishop. I like this. It's a good practical choice. Very good move. And for Humpy, you may have to make a move like Bishop to G7 to get out of uh, that Rook's path. You could bring your Rook to F8. I'm not sold that that keeps everything together forever, uh, but that move is possible. And I think if I'm Humpy, I'm just trying to play a little quickly because I know my position is terrible. I want to use Salimova's clock against her. Mm -hmm. You have to do that. Mr. Uh, move 30, and there you see bishop g7. What are we expecting? Knight to come to f4, introducing a new piece into the attack. Looks completely Looks reasonable good. and strong. Yeah. And the bishop I, I just can wanna... come out to g5. Anything goes. Ooh, she just protects all of her pieces. Everything is doing well here, and the advantage is growing for white. Every decision, a good one from Selimova. And I want to quick, give a quick shout to the other games because they're also in time trouble and it's hard to keep track everywhere. But it looks like Anna Muzichuk still a pawn ahead and trying to press in a rook, two rook endgame per side uh, position. And then Katarina Lakno still in the driver's seat, better position for her against Tan Zhang Yi. But I think Humpy, I don't know if she'll make it to the time control given the last few moves from Selimova. Knight c6 played, and now Salomova is ticking down to that minute mark. The rook on h2 is, doesn't have that many squares either. <laughs> That's true. Um, it has h7 and h5 and h3, so it's got a few squares here, but it's on the verge of being trapped. Right, you know, you can see him, uh, you know, 
you can see a world where G4 gets played. Uh, that's, and G4 that's this is played. <laughs> it is. <laughs> this is the reality. And now the rook has to step back. Unpleasant choice. The, the rook might get trapped. You're right. That even a move like rook h4, king f2, king g3, the king was on the g file, went to the e file, will come back. And with pretty devastating effect, it's going to help trap the rook. And this rook on d1 is waiting for that rook to leave because then it will slide over the h1 with some checkmating ideas. Mm -hmm. Yep. And where would you put the rook? What is the trickiest square? It's I think a, I'm, I know I'm asking a difficult question. I'm out of tricks because what Nergul has done is she put all of her pieces on perfect squares. So there are no tricks available. And oh, she almost grabbed the rook and she slides it back one square to h3. And now I'm bringing my king in for sure. King f2, so king, king g2, two. chase that rook. Absolutely. And uh, the rook on g6 is just beautifully positioned. It cannot be chased away unless there is some knight to e7 ideas. At some point, yeah. But the rook can slide back and across the board. <laughs> the knight can only do so much. And at the worst case scenario, you can bring your rook to h5 and trade it off and continue pressing with a pawn to the good. Now this is, got a feel for Humpy. She tried valiant effort, but the res resilience, the fortitude from Salamova has been too much to handle. Yeah, rook to g5, beautiful move again. And it's your idea in play, just trading off the rooks and then just using that past h pawn. And what I like about it is it doesn't give Humpy any chance whatsoever. And this is, these are all also moves played with no time on the clock. She made that move with 30 seconds left. Rook impressive. H5, very nice. I, I really am super impressed. I thought after yesterday's result, uh, where she did struggle against Vaishali, that uh, with Humpy playing this pawn storm on the king side very early in the game, that she could be in some trouble. But uh, it, you don't get into the candidates by accident, and you don't become as strong as Nergil Salimova without losing a game somewhere and then bouncing back. And she's doing that marvelously. Yep. Rook F8 played Humpy desperately looking for those tricks, setting up ideas of Bishop to H6, attacking the Rook, and in turn, this Bishop on F4. Well, I still wouldn't underestimate the power of the clock. Sergio no. Salimova now down to 30 seconds, drops the Bishop back to G2. That's a good move, Lovely. just attacking the Rook. But I, I like your point that, yeah, I. I I think my mindset is she's played so well to this point. She's about to score a victory. But as you said, there's still a number of moves to make it to the time patrol. And she may not blunder and lose, but you could throw away most of your advantage with just one inaccuracy. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And now it's Humpy's turn. She is coming down to that minute mark. I always I often find that when it comes to this point, I tend to panic. For some yeah. reason, you look over at the clock and it says 57 seconds and then it goes down. Rick H7. Not, I don't think that's Maybe the now square you, takes C7. You, you dreamed of, right? When you, no. <laughs> nice find, by the way. I was even looking at that pawn, but that looks free. I, I also really like your plan of Rook H5. But do that later. Rook h5 is not going anywhere. So stealing that free c7 pawn seems advisable. And she's down under 30 seconds. So I am thinking she's well on her way to victory. And then I see the clock. And that makes me a little bit nervous because I know how I've been in time trouble. And she did take on c7. So Yvanka, great call by you. And I think that's just the smartest decision. Yeah, it is the smart decision. Very practical. And uh, they are now on move 35. So getting closer to that all important move 40 upon which the players will be getting that extra 30 minutes on the clock. Do you think Do Salimova <laughs> has made it? Do you think she will be able to navigate this position? 
yeah, I do think she's just cruising at this stage and Humpy's giving it her all, but two pawns ahead is Salimova. So well, we should keep an eye on this, but maybe we can look at the other games as they approach uh, that critical move 40. Uh, I think that, uh, well, it looks like Nurgil, oh, she was moving and it looks like we're going to the leader, at least heading into the round in Tan Zhang Yi. But I, I guess she's getting out of her chair, but from what I'm seeing, she only made her 39th move. So that's a bit of a strange timing uh, to leave your chair, but it looks like she's completely lost at this stage, according to the evaluation bar. Yeah. And, well, the decision, this deep horn is so, so strong. Check. There's a check possibility on C8 for Lagno, and Lagno has plenty of time on the clock to consider what to play. Does she first attack the queen? Does she throw in the check? Bear in mind, there's also a bishop on e3, which is eyeing up that loose pawn on b6. And yep, the rook comes down to attack the queen. And uh, Lagno has spotted something that she wants to munch on. And I'm going to inform everybody that was the only move that kept this winning advantage. Rook c6. We typically tell people checks captures threats but the check on c8 was premature just to show you that rook c8 check black well that doesn't have many moves the king can't escape so rook d8 it would be and the difference is let's say you try to bring your rook back to c6 the back rank is defended for black so it turns out that you can create a counter threat watch out the white king cannot escape here and then queen a1 is the sneaky checkmate threat of uh, black zone. So that rook c6 move was very precise and it keeps her with the winning advantage according to the evaluation bar. And it is move 40. So Katarina has earned her extra 30 minutes. Yeah. And uh, well, I love rook to c6. Well, the big point that I'm spotting is that this pawn on b6 is just going to fall. So she throws in queen to a1 check. Simply going to be met by king h2. Absolutely. Just getting out of the check and uh, b6 falls, rook c8, d6 is going to hurt you uh, because mm -hmm. you can't afford to take it. All sorts of threats against the black king. This looks like a very dominant position for Lagno. Yeah. King a2, indeed. They have now... reached move 40, uh, Ivanka, so I don't know uh, if the players are going to slow down at all but they have earned their extra time. Yes, <laughs> but for Tan, it's going to be an uphill task, probably insurmountable task to hold this one because the pawn on b6 falls, as you mentioned, the d5 pawn, so strong. Should we just check in quickly on the Salimova game? Let's do that because those players, I do not believe, have made it to move 40. But as we see in the bottom right, Anna Muzichuk against Lei Tingji, that looks like it's going to last a long time with Anna pressing a pawn ahead uh, on the queen side. You see two extra pawns there. But let's go back to the Salamova game against Humpy Koneru because Humpy down under a minute and we have reached move 39. And I guess the only question I have, considering how well Salamova's playing is, are we really going to reach move 40 or is Humpy going to throw in the towel? Be a sad result for the many Indian fans out there. Yeah, it would be very tough for Humpy because remember, tomorrow is the rest day. And it's never good to lose before the rest day because often you're just going to stew over your approach. You're going to stew over the, res the result of the game and it's just that extra day to process everything. So we have a move. Bishop takes bishop. I would say the Humpy is going to carry on fighting. She's uh, known as a comeback queen. She's very resilient. I think she was going to try. But I suspect after rook takes rook and uh, bishop takes... Oh, knight. Knight takes easy. Attacking the knight, the bishop on g6. And I think after rook takes... A rook on h3, you could even consider knight takes bishop with check intermezzo, but the simple bishop takes back 
G6 and E6 are hanging and white is two pawns ahead. So for Humpy, she may make the second time control, but unfortunately for her, the result I don't think is really in the question. The extra time only helps Salimova's chances, but she, as you said, she's a fighter. We'll see if she's able to drum up some play, but it doesn't look likely at this stage. No, but uh, it would be, it's going to be interesting actually to be a fly on the wall for Humpy, right? Because she went in hard. And at first it looked like her gamble in the opening paid off. You know, she got what looked like a very promising position, a very strong knight on E4. But then Salimova just calmly fought that initiative off. And then Humpy was left with all sorts of dynamic problems, like how to coordinate her pieces, where to put her king. And Salimova just had the easier position on a practical level to play. So I wonder whether, like the how the mood will be in uh, the camp. Will it be like okay, that was a that was a difference in style that didn't pay off. We'll go back to what Humpy does best, which is classical, you know, positional chess. Or will they kind of say, well, hang on a second, it's fine. It just didn't work out in this, but our approach is clear. We're going to sharpen things up. I think the one thing that you can take as solace is the fact that Tan Zhengyi is likely to lose because Humpy entered the round a point behind the sole leader. And even if others join uh, Tan Zhengyi, at least Humpy is still within that striking distance. So that is something that won't really make her feel so much better, but it's so early at the can. It's four rounds in, one point behind, you will have plenty of ground to make up and chances to do so uh, if you are humpy. But this game, I think, really says much more to me about Selimova and her determination, her exemplary uh, ability to stave off the first storm and the second one, and just to keep her composure, to bring her king out in the open, just to drag it back to its starting square. The way she handled this game truly was remarkable. So I have to tip my proverbial cap because it was such a nice game and still going on. Humpy may be able to make a mess out of it still, but I, I do think that Salamova really showed that she belongs in this tournament and she is a force to be reckoned with. She certainly is. And uh, this is the perfect time for us to take a quick break now that all the players have made move 40. So don't go anywhere because after the break, we'll come back with more of the end game action. All right, Vaishali, I'm super excited uh, to meet you, to, to be able to talk to you um, here in Prague, heading into the candidates in, uh, well, only a month or so. And it's been an incredible year. I, I bet you will agree with that. Can you, can you describe it this past year, becoming a grandmaster, uh, winning the Grand Swiss, obviously qualifying for the candidates? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, okay, last year has been in, uh, a different year, I would say, like sort of a roller coaster, but it ended very like a dream year for me. I had few bad tournaments in the row, like starting I, like YKNZ was a okay tournament. Then I didn't play with, well in the Grand Prix, Women Grand Prix. Then I lost my dating so much. And then uh, I, uh, then I fell sick in between. I had to uh, withdraw from some tournaments. Uh, it was really tough for me during that time. And then I played, I made my final GM nom in Qatar Masters and winning Grand Swiss. Uh, I mean, so it's just a dream year for me I'm to complete the Grandmaster title as well. I mean, to becoming Grandmaster has been uh, my goal like since my childhood. So I was very, very happy to have completed the title. This fight to be in there, to, to become world champion that you are now in the candidates, has that sort of always been something you feel pressure to? Have you always dreamed about being where you are now? Yeah, like uh, I mean, to becoming women world champion has always like it was also one of the things like uh, I mean to become grandmaster and to become women world champion something it's always in my head and uh, yeah that is also one of the questions like I don't want to take any pressure but at the same time the tournament is in such a status that uh, there is a lot of pressure as well so for now I'm taking it easy like I'm just preparing I'm just enjoying every day like working on the game and now I'm playing Prague currently and I'm just taking it easy like uh, I don't know maybe there will be some difference when 
close like approaching the tournaments probably uh, i'm just taking now lightly how how big of a moment is this to to uh, be playing in the candidates for you in your career uh, it's a great moment like we have followed candidates tournament but especially in women's like uh, this is the second edition we have for the women candidates as a separate but like uh, as candidates in all it's it's such a big tournament like one of the most important tournament in chess and i'm very happy to be playing in it so yeah oh wow obviously uh, prague will be playing in his candidates as well so are you guys preparing at all together towards that yeah yeah we are i mean uh, we are discussing a lot about the tournament like in general a lot about uh, more lot about these days yeah so with all of this fantastic stuff happening how is your confidence heading into the candidates uh, i'm i'm just in general like i'm very happy about, like how things are panning out like uh, I'm just enjoying life. It's <laughs> all good. And it's said that, and you mentioned it yourself, that playing in the candidates is some of the hardest thing you can do in chess. It's a very difficult uh, tournament to win. So what do you expect from it? Yeah, it's a long tournament. Uh, we'll be going through, I think, I'm just hoping like a lot of emotions. To, like, uh, uh, yeah, like mentally also I'm getting ready for it. You have to be like fit until the to- until the end. Probably it will be the longest tournament I would ever, ever be playing. Like my first longest tournament. Like. Uh, so i'm sort of mentally also getting ready for everything what kind of mentality are you then heading into the candidates that's a question into it's running in my head almost like every day like i wanted to keep it simple like as i did in the last few months which worked for me uh at the same time i want to win i want i want that hunger as well so it's sort of like it's in the head so i want to take it lightly i just want to enjoy the game like i get to play against like some best women players in the world so i want to make use of it and give my best yeah And what would it mean if you actually win the candidates and you're qualified to play the World Championship match? What would that mean to you in your career, your family, everyone? I mean, it's great. Uh, every player would dream to play World Championship. Yeah. Uh, I mean, when I'm starting, uh, I mean, when I started as a kid, like chess. I mean, it is one of the things you have to become world champion. So it would be great. I mean, to even think about it, it just feels great.
Hello and welcome back. And after quite a frantic time control dash to get to move 40, well, we do have one result, one game that has been finished. That was between Alexandra Goreshkina and uh, Vaishali. That ended in quite a peaceful draw, very well played game, but three games remaining in progress. And Robert, it looks like we are in for a decisive day of chess, our best yet, with three games looking, if you're going to judge the evaluation bars, looking like they're going to be victories for the white pieces. And I agree, not just with the evaluation bar, because who am I to disagree uh, with the engines, but I'm looking at the games and they look from a human perspective, like ones where white really should be winning these positions. And if we look in the bottom right, we haven't tuned into that game in quite a long time. And Amuzi Chuk's just up a pawn in a rook end game, but it's not just any pawn. She has a clear pass pawn and she's got the active king. And I think that means that Lei Tingji is not going to have many chances to survive. Yes, it does look like it's one of those scenarios where the white king will just uh, walk over to assist the B pawn. And that will be it. So, for sometimes, instance, yeah. <laughs> I would say sometimes chess is that simple, you know? Like, <laughs> the White King helps out, and there's nothing that Black can do about it. Right. Okay, so I was just thinking, in this position, it is uh, Black to play. If you go, I don't know, F takes E5. I was okay, thinking, just uh... take that with your king. Yep. And now if uh, white tries to, sorry, black tries to go rook to g3, you just step with your rook to c4. And the king will come to assist the b-pawn. The g-pawn is untouchable. The worst nightmare for a player yep. down a pawn in a rook end game is the opponent's king is active. Their rook on, at all at once protects both sides of the board in a way that makes their pawns untouchable so this is just very straightforward especially for a player who's as technically gifted as Anna Muzichuk it's, she's the type of player who will convert these positions nearly every time and I, you know, I'm not trying to commentate his curse here but it's just true she's got a very uh, great gift for the end game and she works very hard on it she certainly does and uh, going back to the live board is there anything that they can do just to mix things up so I was thinking rook to b3 rook b3 is definitely a try i'm wondering if rook c4 if i can just sort of do the same thing where i bring my rook back and then i'm gonna bring my king on over i don't really think black can stop it yeah, it's kind of like a one size fits all plan yeah it, it, absolutely rook c4 the rook protects both the pawn on b4 and g4 and in a way this e pawn is just completely irrelevant but then there's absolutely nothing for Lei Ting Jie then. Can absolutely. I just, sorry, Yvonne, can I just back up to one point? Because I'm reading the notation and it looks like they were repeating moves a couple of times. So if we just bring up an analysis board, I think that Anna might have sort of coaxed her opponent into a false sense of security. As I look around here, this is where the, uh, was it even a, yeah, let me just check. Yeah, right here. So white is setting up some kind of third rank defense. Is clearly better, but black is trying to blockade. And then at this point, we saw a repetition of moves where black is just going rook d8, rook a8, and saying you can't make progress. And then Anna very wisely brought her rook to c5 because she's trying to exploit, and this would happen in the game, that there was a pin along the fifth rank. And as we see, that's a big problem for black to deal with but let's say black stepped out of the pin white is in time to push the b pawn because black is just too slow you want to double up on my pawn go for it you think that's free i'm not going to take you on a3 first but i'm going to push my pawn to b7 attacking your rook which has to stay on the eighth rank and then you lose your other rook so this was a very good spot from and a Mizuchuk who did not just repeat moves aimlessly, she actually found the critical plan that allowed her to gain the upper hand, even though she was up one pawn, that wasn't the decisive blow. She needed to create a second threat. Yeah, 
I must commend her on her beautiful in-game strategy, but also it's very reminiscent of how hustlers play chess <laughs> when they don't have so much time on the clock. They just repeat moves. They just make these series of quiet moves and then they go for that very dangerous move full of poison. And there you can see it done to perfection. And here the position just looks completely straightforward. The rook really drops back nothing. to c4. I see absolutely nothing either. Yeah, and uh, there we can remind ourselves of the standings. You can see that uh, town is on two points, um, two and a half points out of three. So anyhow. Yeah, I think Goryachkina, she's so far happy by how things are going across the board. But you know what's interesting is in a game like this with players who entered the round one out of three in the minus camp, the fact that I, I'm not saying she's going to lose for sure, although I do think that Katarina Lucknow will ice that game up. But I, I feel like when you enter a round with one out of three, a minus score, you're a bit worried about your tournament. But then suddenly, if you win the game, you're back to even. And then you look around and you're like, okay, people are only a half point ahead. No one's running away with this thing that builds your confidence as you enter a rest day. So for someone like Anna Muzichuk, who was disappointed she didn't beat Katarina Lucknow a day ago in a winning position, but really difficult to spot win. I think now you start to recover and head into a rest day with your head held high. Yeah, and uh, Lei is a fantastic opponent. Let's not also forget that there's some family pride here at stake as well, because in 2022 at the Women's Candidates, Lei Tingjie first up, she eliminated Maria Muzichuk from the competition. That's a uh, Anna's younger sister. And then she went on to defeat Anna in the next stage before she defeated Tan Zhong Yi and then challenged for the crown. So when you have that kind of uh, rivalry or, or kind, then a victory will be extra sweet, and especially in such an important event such as the candidates. But for Anna, a very, very important victory. She did appear to be quite uh, down yesterday evening, especially because once soon as she finished the game, everyone, of course, descended on her and then told her, you missed a win. You could have played queen to f7. And that's the last thing you want to be hearing after you've played a game. It's been a tough fight. You've sensed that there's a win, but you haven't managed to find it. And it wasn't an easy spot, as you've mentioned so difficult and i i feel like that's the downside in some ways of when you're playing these high level chess events and everyone's watching you and they have that auto correct feature they have the engine they instantly see the moment you make a mistake and then they can ask you about that but it, mistakes they don't really often happen out of the blue it's not like she just blundered a queen and something like that no it was a really difficult spot and an awkward queen maneuver uh, to give a check and then move it one square in the diagonal rather than give another check or try to capture material. So I feel like it's understandable, even if as a player, you don't forgive yourself so quickly. I think when you play a game like she has today, where out of the opening, we I think we're not so high on her position, but she found that G4 move. So instead of just allowing the position to uh, remain quiet, She's the one who sprung into action. She took this pawn on b7. She ended up a pawn ahead, and she said to Lei Tingji, prove that you can hold. And I think that's often a good strategy, especially when people are nearing time trouble and it's a situation where you have to be accurate. I think she did the exact right thing in this game where she didn't truly take many risks herself, but she took just enough to create an imbalance, and then she forced her opponent to find the accurate follow-ups, and Lei Tingji wasn't quite able to. Yeah, I, I've been impressed by her courageousness. She, as you highlighted, she played a lot of moves that quite frankly had a lot of guts, like G4. Not all of us would be there willingly weakening our king. She also, at the critical moment, she calculated, and this is also a fantastic sign, that she could quite accurately allow Black to capture on H3, and she had enough defensive resources to combat this. I've been very impressed with how she played this game, full of very, like, I would say, like, what's the word? Like, 
just full of very um anyway just good decisions <laughs> basically <laughs> i was gonna try to fill in the blank but I, I wasn't sure because there's so many complimentary adjectives yeah it was something good yeah exactly <laughs> anyhow so it looks like anna is well on her way to winning this one g5 has been played and I, I just think she can really choose yeah. the move because eventually her rook will come to c4 the white king will venture on over towards the queen side king f5 for instance the one idea that black possibly has and this is where you can go wrong as a player if you assume the game is over i'm going to show this quickly is that the king f5 rook f3 check let's say you go up to e6 Pawn takes e5, king takes e5, and then rook f4. Sometimes this is a huge problem where you have just given up one of your pawns, and it turns out somehow miraculously that white is still winning. I don't really clue see why. It's probably because the white pawn is so fast, and black will have to sacrifice the rook. And let me check. I'll flip on the moves. And yeah, rook c6 check, king to g7, and then you get g4, but you are slow. And very importantly, the black king is cut off here. So the white king will scramble on over to c7. Actually, that's a really important uh, idea because the, the black king is cut off. The white king can just uh, simply advance to help the pawn. And you can let the g pawn run quite far up the board. But the point is that there's such a big disconnect between the king and the pawn that the rook will keep this uh, g2 pawn under check and we're going to be yeah exactly and then you're going to go b8 and this is just elementary win for white just showing that the as you pointed out the king is way too far away from this pawn you would need your king to get to g4 and then it would be a draw so it's really important really instructive to note when a, an enemy king is cut off and that means that the winning chances are sky high and the chances of the draw are quite low. So Anna's doing the right thing, though. She's using her time. She's not assuming the win. She's not taking anything for granted. And she will decide where to bring her king because king e4 should also be winning at this stage. Yes. Okay. So whilst Anna is uh, working out what is the most accurate move, should we go back to the bird's eye view and uh, check in on the other two games? And the position is fast looking quite hopeless for Humpy there on the top right corner. Do you want to start with that game because it is looking hopeless, but the game on the left hand side of our screen between Kettering Lakno and Tan Zhang Yi, somehow Zhang Yi is really holding on and she hasn't uh, made any game ending errors. So that game looks to continue, but I think we should first dive in if you're okay with it to. Yeah the Salimova humpy game. Let's uh, go there and so we have two extra white pawns still. Pawns. White. Yeah, white is up two pawns, a better minor piece. <laughs> I'm trying to come up with an angle for how black can survive and I'm thinking is there a way to blockade on the dark squares versus a light square bishop? That sometimes gives you chances. If it were up to me, I think I'd play a4. I don't really want to give up any pawns over there on the queen side. And at some point, I will have checks along d file to go after black's queen side. Yeah, totally. I, I like your idea of a4. I was also tempted just to rush it with rook to d8 and uh, snatch off the b7 pawn, but there's no need for such complications. Yeah, something like this. I'm guessing you're going for it, taking on b7. Yeah. And the engine loves it. So it it's, goes to show that most things are winning for white at this stage, up a couple of pawns. Totally. And uh, well, it is hopeless for Humpy. She will be losing this one. So let's go and revisit the game between uh, Lagno and Tan Zhong Yi. You mentioned that it seemed like Tan was just simply hold well trying doing her best at holding on i think relative to where she was earlier the game on the top left 
This feels better because she's not getting checkmated. She is down a pawn, but certain trades will allow her to liquidate into positions that she may feel that she's got a chance to uh, save a half point. It's very nice for white. There's an extra pawn. It's a passer. It can be pushed. The rook for white is very active, putting pressure on black's loose pawn. But you know what I mean, Yvanka? These games, these positions, you sometimes do something in a hurry, and then it actually allows your opponent to survive. And it's one of these positions where I don't see the clearest plan for white. I know I want to push my pawn, but I might do that too early. So when you look at this position, what sort of kind of construction should black adopt in your opinion to give her the most chances to hold? Well, that's going to depend very much on what white does, because if white is going bishop to c7, then you have to do something about the rook. If uh, if white goes for construction where they just get the queen behind the d pawn in order to push it, well then, how to mix that one up? I don't know. Queen to d3. I, I don't think yeah. there's a hard and fast rule here. Maybe just try to swap off pawns, try to go a5 and... A5. See whether you can try to ever get a position where the queens are off. I'm with you. Trading pawns seems to be helpful because that's the second weakness that black has to deal with. And as you said, if it's white's turn, white can play a move like queen d3 behind the pawn. So maybe queen d1, pawn a5, these are moves that come to mind. Uh, I think that that's how black should best try and salvage this. But it's not going to be easy, of course. Mm-hmm. Actually, though, can I ask you a question? After Mm -hmm. queen d1, how are you saving this d5 pawn? Well, 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 I have d6. And if I take you, do you have no back rank checkmate because my queen... No, I have nothing. I have nothing Mm -hmm. happening there on on the back row, unfortunately just i'll show everybody because it looks like it should be a win but the black rook goes back and the queen long distance protects the rook and stops the checkmate okay so queen to d1 i had neglected to see that it was black's move i thought it was white to play because of queen to d1 queen to d1 what else to do you could grab a6 but that's not ideal for white that's where black starts thinking about trades and saying you don't have enough material remaining to win this game do i have weird moves such as queen to f3 and what's your goal hang on a second yeah no i have not i have an idea i have an idea so after queen to after to queen to d1 because i've just because what i want to do is i want to let you win the pawn on d5 but I want the queens to come off. And if that happens, I'm able to go rook to b8. But I oh. need to orchestrate it at the right time and in the right manner. Oh, so I see exactly what you're going for. And she brought her queen somewhere. Queen to a2. Okay, so sort of similar going after the d5 and the f2 pawns. Yeah, but now I'm thinking you go bishop to e3. Oh, you are so clever. And actually in the game, that's even more likely. So I, I think we'll show what your point is. Queen d5. And instead of taking a loose pawn a6, you wanted rook to b8 and bishop yes. to c5. Oh, you're a very clever, clever player indeed. And actually, even it's more like the Even at 1 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is super relevant. Like I, I was posing the question just to come up with suggestions. But the reason this is so relevant is in the game, she went queen to a2, threatening not just d5, but this very important f2 pawn that you're not going to give up. So bishop e3 is like a natural move. I see the engine doesn't like it, and maybe there's some saving move for black, but queen takes d5 is not that move because of the variation we just looked at where we trade queens and rook to b8. So this becomes very relevant with this idea, piling up pressure on a pinned piece to win the game. And bishop e3 is 
a likely choice, even if the engine at first doesn't like it. Yeah. Yeah. Bishop E3. Um, yeah, one of the things that I also thought about that queen to A2 is that there's no coordination between the queen and the rook. So after a move like bishop to E3, I know the engine doesn't approve, but if black were to go rook takes D5, you can still go rook to B8. And there's with the queen standing on D1, there would be rook to D8. That's right. Now there's Maybe nothing there's... of the sort. This looks painful. So let's try to figure out, instead of taking on D5, both moves lose, as we just saw. There apparently is some other move to save the day. And maybe it's your earlier decision, A5, that you made that suggestion. And mm -hmm. it looks like it's very reasonable at this point, because if Black's pawn is captured, then I can take this pawn on A5 and go after D5 next. And in fact, White can't even defend it. Yep. Yes. Oh. Well, we have a move. D6. Oh. Love oh, it. oh my goodness me. <laughs> that of course was not possible after queen to d1, but now it certainly is. And now queen takes f2. I think oh, how is this going to be met? Rook takes a6? Yes, and then with these two extra pawns on the queen side compared to one extra pawn on the king side for black, uh, those pawns are going to start rumbling up the board. So I, I do think that this was well designed from Lagno and she's played this with superb technique because I was nervous about giving up this pawn so close to my king. Later, the white king will be exposed to checks, but she is not phased whatsoever as she, she follows the 20% rule as my coach used to call it. Whenever you can push to the sixth or seventh or of course to the final rank, you know, 20% of the time that's going to be the correct decision. And this is the one time that's it's needed and it's found pawn to d6. Yes. Well, now I'm just loving that move actually, because the plan is actually very straightforward. Like you say, first up of you, t after you take the pawn on a6, the rook and the queen can coordinate very nicely on a8. So you can already start to dislodge that rook from d8. And all you need to do is just find a stable square for your bishop on f4. And that's Which, it. Put I, it on g3, as you've pointed out. I think I'm just going to make these moves because it seemingly a relatively four sequence. Like, let's say she, I think, did just take this pawn on. Oh, no, she didn't take the pawn. She went a5. So she did not like the look of this. But to your point, you put the bishop on g3, let's say. The queen moves pretty much anywhere. Your rook can slide up to a8 in many of these positions. And if you traded rooks, I saw the engine going down, but I was just trying to get to the point that this D pawn is hard to stop. And if it weren't just the D pawn, there's also the B pawn that can uh, go to the other side. So this is a situation that Black is trying to avoid. And another good find by you. And A5 was the reply from Tan Zhang Yi. And can you capture it? Should you capture it? What moves? are available to white. Even this rook a6 move, <laughs> uh, just pinning the pawn comes to mind. It does come to mind, doesn't it? It looks like it's a great move. What other attempts? It doesn't make too much sense to go b5 because there you do allow black a little bit of hope with a past a pawn. So I quite like your rook a6. Keep it calm. Rook a6, queen takes f2, and you just take this pawn on a5, and that's even more dangerous for black because now your second extra pawn is as far away from the remaining pieces as possible. But this looks overwhelming for yeah. Tan Zhang Yi to deal with. Yeah, and uh, well, Katerina has lots and lots of time on the clock, just over 13 minutes. All she has to do is keep her nerve and she will win this game and well what will a, a loss mean to tan zhong yi because i felt like she played this opening quite well it was a and that sometimes at some point it felt like the initiative was passing to her because we did see a scenario there in the middle game where where tan sacrificed a pawn 
And then she played in a really good way in order to attack three of White's pawns. And I thought that the position would just fizzle out into a draw, but something went wrong with her putting the queen all the way offside. Yeah, that decision was not one that you can take lightly. She didn't have that much time. So mistakes happen when you are under duress mm -hmm. on both the board and clock. But this one, I think the players continue to slug it out. Should we maybe venture on over to one of our other remaining games? Because I do think the end is nearer for some of those. Well, the end might be near, but I think it's the perfect time for us to take a very short break. And we'll be back with all the endings of the game when we come back. This April, intergenerational rivalries spill over to the chessboard, face off against the boomers, grapple with Gen X and the millennials, or take on the young guns of Gen Z, Gen Alpha, and Gen Beta. And then the mighty Martin? Play them all on chess.com. Are you struggling with chess? Is your only hope of beating your opponent by using a big stick? A really, really big stick? Introducing Aim Chess, the revolutionary solution for those suffering from chess challenge syndrome. Aim Chess provides a unique blend of concentrated tactics, opening training, and deep analytics to help you claw your way out of sucking at chess. Say goodbye to bishop blunders, knight nightmares, and queen catastrophes. Master the fundamentals of chess and learn how to turn your chess frown into a chess crown. The Aim Chess secret formula is made with real grandmasters and magic. Thanks to Aim Chess, I've learned how to do a smothered mate. They never see it coming. I didn't have any friends before I used Aim Chess. Now I can play chess. So try Aim Chess today. What could possibly go wrong? Consult your doctor before using Aim Chess. Do not use Aim Chess if you are pregnant, allergic to Grandmaster, operating heavy machinery, operating light machinery, or enjoy sucking at chess. Side effects may include nausea, dizziness, loss of hair, excessive celebration, increased ego, and an uncontrollable desire to challenge people to games of chess. Taking Aim Chess with alcohol may result in false confidence and massive rating crashes. Please consult your opponents before consuming Aim Chess. I can guarantee that working your way through this course and solving all 1001 exercises will reward you not only with a greater tactical knowledge, but also with spotting more tactics in your own games. My name is Fiona Steil Anthony and I'm a Women International Master. I wish you a warm welcome to the course 1001 Chess Exercises for Beginners, authored by Franco Mazzetti and Roberto Massa, with videos by me. In this case, the knight on c5 is not protected, and so the winning move is g6. g6 is the discovered attack, but it is also a double attack, because not only are we hitting the knight on c5, we are also threatening mate on h7. In this case, rook c7. Black has no choice but to capture, and now our queen comes in. We've lured the queen away. Now the king is too far removed. It cannot protect the black queen, so we are going to pick up the Black Queen on the next move.
Welcome back. And uh, we are still here. And the final portion of round four of the women's candidates, three games still very much in play, all with a decisive white advantage. But earlier on, we did see a draw between Alexandra Grieschkina and Vaishali. That was a very accurate result indeed. But Robert, going to the other three games, have there been any significant changes? The bar is all the way up in the game between Katarina Lucknow and Tan Zhongyi. So Lucknow playing the precise continuations. We see on the right-hand side of our screen, Nurgil Salomova still in the driver's seat with a winning advantage against Humpy Conero. But I think we should go to the game on the bottom right. To my eyes, at first, I'm like, that should be easy. It's a rook versus a couple pawns. But looks can be deceiving. And Ivanka, the evaluation off the side, it is winning for white this is a table-based position but Muzichuk and Leitinji they don't have the table base at their disposal so one wrong decision could change us from a win for white to a draw yes 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 and uh, we were discussing this particular position during the break and i'm actually reminded of a game that i myself played a long time in a tournament in Norway. And there I actually made a mess of it and I drew. I had, it wasn't two pawns versus a rook, it was just a one pawn. And afterwards I uh, spoke to a friend of mine and he said, no, 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 no. You walk your king around the back. That's how you win. So he, he taught me about this whole technique of putting the king on F7, king to G7, and then going round the side, which kind of doesn't make much sense when you don't know it but mm -hmm. when you see it done you're like ah yes i understand this whole concept so how narrow is the path to victory now here for anna it, it's extremely narrow and it's exactly what you suggested clearly you learned your lesson and for those of you at home please take this as a lesson because many of us myself included when i was younger and wasn't studying my end games I would just go after this pawn. Why wouldn't you? That pawn is under attack by the king. Let's join it up with the rook, steal one of the two pawns, and then win, right? The answer lies in the fact that the white king needs to be on f2. You would rather not win the pawn and have your king on a square like f2 to make sure that the enemy pawns are not getting to the other side. And just to show you what happens when you make a move like rook f8, bam, right in the center, g4. Rook takes pawn check, it has to be winning, except it isn't because the black king will help escort this pawn to the other side as the white rook will have to step behind. The black king will step forward and all the way up to F2. And the best that white has is to sacrifice this rook for the second pawn. So Ivanka, you take it away because this is how you don't win the game. But what you just said and what you learned, that is how, in fact, you do win. And it's really complicated. Oh, uh, yeah. And... So it just involves the king just walking around the back, king f7, and then you start. Yep. And how to win this one? I guess you. Uh, you got it. You got it. This and after rich king f4, this okay, is, this and then is now you the moment. King to g6. But can, like, this is so, it's so understandable when someone makes a mistake here. King takes f6 is a free pawn, right? You have to take this pawn. But to show you how tricky endgames can be is that the king takes pawn, draw again, g3. And there's no way the white king gets down here or over here. It's not happening. The black king is perfectly placed. And we can get a position where white just follows black's lead. But you're not actually making any progress. And here, the king gets the f2. And I'm going to promote. You have to give up your rook. So Ivanka. That decision that you said after king f4, king g6, are you kidding me? Really tricky, but the only way to win because the white king will come around. Yeah. Oh, it's there you can see it being done. King now chases, and this is the whole point. The king and the rook will work together to catch up the g2 pawn. But I want to also mentioned something that I'm surprised going back to the live board that the players have reached this position. H how did 
this occur? You want me to, I'll backtrack and get us, we left off it. A little bit because I'm trying, I'm trying to understand the flow of the game because here it looked like Anna completely winning. Like we were, I, I almost thought it was resign time. You just step back with the rook, the king rushes to the pawn and I would have sworn my life that that's exactly how the game continued. Oh, she and, made the oh, wrong move. She made the wrong move. You'll see the evaluation bar. Take a dip. There it is. It's down in the middle and you have to feel for her. We were just going to show how this happened. And I'll quickly do that. The black rook came around. White pushed this pawn up to e6, which got us to this position where white is objectively winning, but there was only one path towards the win. And at this stage right here, and it goes rook d5 check, which allows black to draw. But, and this is critical. There's only one move that draws, and it's king to f4, not king to e4, or king, well, king g4 is clearly bad. You get up this pawn, and then this one, but king to f4, which I think is the most natural move for black holes. So Anna misses it. Okay. So the, I guess the reason why king to e4 loses is because of king great. to e is it rook to a5? <laughs> it's, it's These positions are so tricky. Rook a5, I guess the pawn just starts going, and I don't know if we can catch it here. No. g4, you take, yeah, g3, and the king and the pawn are too close. Hmm. So what is it? We can bring up the table base, and that way we don't have to wander for ourselves. It is rook d1 as the only way forward. And I guess the difference is that the white king, if it takes this pawn, will be able to get to a square like g5 and wrap around as we showed in the other continuation. Mm -hmm. Yep. Wow. But okay, how easy is it to find rook to d1? If you don't know Not about easy. it. Not easy, but I think for black, what you see here is king f4. And the reason why this is a draw is also very instructive for those of you watching is this check. Your king has to stay in touch with the pawn. King up, king up, push, because it was under attack. Check again. We're just going to keep repeating this pattern. And Yvonka, you and I and the players, they know that this position is a draw. But when you get here and then this happens, some players have pre-move and auto queen on. Instead, you have to get a knight because if you get a queen, you get checkmated. So for all of you at home, those of you who are improving and trying to get better and learn some chess, in this position, you have no choice but to get a knight. And it is a theoretical, a table-based draw, but many players have lost this position, even if the engine says you're supposed to make that half point. Yeah, unfortunately, this is exact position that I got <laughs> with uh, Rick against Knight in that uh, famous endgame that I was talking about. And um, I have discovered that, yes, it doesn't look like the Knight on B1, G1 has too many squares, but it has enough. It just danced over to H3, then danced back again, and then just kept using that little circuit of E2. And I just couldn't get, didn't manage to do anything. It looks like it should be winning before the you promote to a knight. And it still isn't that easy once you get to this stage because if the knight wanders all the way back here, it often gets lost. So the knight and the king need to stay together and work as a team, but white will often try to uh, waste a move or two to force the knight away from that king. But uh, if Anna doesn't win this game, she definitely will feel very sad entering the rest day yesterday that was a tough win to find this one not easy by no means should we call it easy i think she made it harder for herself you asked how did we even get here she brought her king to e4 rather than up the board so she made her path much more difficult and for Lei Tingji, she can make this draw that we're talking about by bringing her king and pawn up together and then promoting to a knight yeah and unfortunately for Anna, king to f4 is a very, very natural move. And there are some end games that one just knows. So do you think she'll find it? I 
think she doesn't have a choice. You know, the night, get a, get a night down there. It might be, look like a donkey, but that's a, a horse that you can promote to. And I, I feel like Lei Tingji, she is fortunate to be in this position. I think her first round loss really hurt her. Uh, I think that was uh, something that she didn't expect, especially with the white pieces. But she is very fortunate if she does, in fact, make this draw because she was in a losing position that Anna Muzicic would win, I would say, 95 out of 100, but this is one of those five. Yep. And now King takes F6, played, and this is where the G pawn just starts advancing. Oh. Well, Robert, I think we're going to be in for a long night because <laughs> even even when uh, Lady Ting Jay manages to promote, to under promote the pawn to a knight, of course, Anna will play that one on for as long as she possibly can. Wait a second. I'm visualizing, bear with me. I, I was doing this in my head. Is there like a trick here that allows black to immediately draw? So if we follow the variation that I was talking about, that we get all this, the stuff, check, here, 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 check. Can the black king go here and over to h1? Because if you play um, your king closer, I hide in the corner, and once you take my pawn, it's stalemate. Yep. <laughs> that, that is, uh, okay, so anything else that you can do? If I go king to f3, it's exactly the same business. Is it possible? Hang on, that... if I put, no, no, hang on. If I put my king on f3. Okay. No, 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 of course, because you can. Just, I have to go rook takes g2. Just a, a stalemate for those of you keeping track at home. The rook means that the king can't escape, but it's not in check. And that is what we call stalemate. May not happen in your games too often, except when you're down a queen and your opponent doesn't deliver the checkmate. But this is a very instructive example of how stalemate can occur in very top level games. So I think that we could even see a quicker draw unless uh, right here, I'm wondering if white can go around like king to g4 and after g2 check this king g1 does it still work. It still works. I thought the king going to h3 would stop it. But it's the same exact thing where it's stalemate. Nice. Nice trick. I, I don't think I ever registered that one. I'm pretty sure I've seen it some in different different scenarios, but uh, not in this one. So lovely to have that one in the memory bank. Yeah. And I don't know, when I saw that it was a rook and two pawns, I thought that perhaps Anna was on the wrong trajectory, that she had the momentum wasn't going in her way. Shall we go to the live board and have a look at how the other games are continuing? Let's do that. I mean, it seems like one game is now back towards the middle, despite what had previously been a winning advantage. We'll see if Humpy or Tan Zheng Yi can do the same. I, I will say, um, Yvanka, in the top left, it looks like Katarina Lakno is doing everything possible in the right way. It seems like she's played a really fantastic game, but I do sense that the white king is in a little bit of danger. And if the clocks are accurate, is Katarina Lakno down to four minutes? She is. She is. Ooh. And look at that. Did you just see the evaluation bar? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. No way. Yes. It's equal. It is equal. Because I was just thinking here, after bishop to e5, queen to e6, how on earth do you defend that bishop and the pawn at the same time? So if you bring your queen back, you've unpinned this bishop. So bishop takes d6, d6. exists. Wait a second. Yes. Let's go back one move here. What move was winning? Because this pawn is lost if you move your bishop anywhere else. All right, I'm going to use the engine. No. You want to know, Ivanka? It's bishop f2, giving up this pawn with check, and then playing king h1 because you'll win with your other pawn. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Nobody plays like that. 
Well, qu queen to e4 played. Bishop takes d6. It's just even. Mm. My goodness me. So we've seen two miracle saves or potential miracle saves. Bishop takes d6. And as we've highlighted, as the bar indicates, it is even on account of the fact that white's king is not particularly safe on h2. And in the oh. end, this whole plan of going h5, h4 was just a great practical try. Once that f2 pawn was captured, you and I at first like, that's not a pawn I really want to give up. The engine supported everything that Katarina Lachno was doing. But that's why we don't just look at the engine and say, uh, this is it. That's it. And I'm guilty of this myself, where sometimes I'm like, this is over. It has to be. But all these players, all the competitors, we're human. We make mistakes. And for Katarina Lachno to make a mistake at this point in this game, I think that all the other participants are going to be upset as well because now it's looking like the winning chances are out the window and is there any alternative to bishop takes d6 because tanjiki hasn't made this move which makes me believe she's looking potentially in another direction yeah i think she's does just, just double checking right after bishop takes d6 just working out what happens after queen to a8 and because the only other alternatives i see are bishop to g7 but there's still queen to a8 and uh, why not just grab that pawn on d6, which is so important. And then another idea is to go f6, but then f6 allows queen to g6 check. So yeah, that could f5 be what she's considering? You know, I, I kind of like your bishop g7 move and perhaps where the thought is happening here. Is it bishop g7, queen check, bishop f8? We're just repeating the position we had a moment ago. So that could be a repetition. Whereas bishop takes d6, queen a8, let's say you retreat bishop f8 because you don't want to see this queen right next to your king. If you go bishop f8, now this bishop has a place to escape to on c7. The game continues. Will white realistically win this game? Maybe not, but I have this outside pass pawn that you have to figure out how to stop and that does look scary. Mm -hmm. No, she's Which taken on d6. I think it was irresistible to take that. And then the question is, after queen a8, can Tan take inspiration from Lagno's own game and run with the king to h8? So the king runs up the board. There is a check on g8 there, but the king keeps running f5. That's it. <laughs> that's all the checks that you get. So you can, in fact, run the king up. And I think that's the easiest way forward for black yeah travel on the light squares uh, so yeah she's running she's surviving this i think is draw immediately if you take on d6 queen takes the king just has nowhere to run to and we just see the black queen going back and forth with the draw mm-hmm I don't see much more to it. Yeah. And uh, Robert, I think we are in for a very long night because in the game between uh, Mazichuk and Lei Ting Jie, we're going to see Rook versus Knight. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> it, uh, that one will prolong this round. This one, on the other hand, is about to result. Joe, handshakes are in, but Ivanka, what a result this is, not just for Tan, Tan Zhang Yi, but for the entire event. And Katarina Lachno is gone. She's like, I cannot believe I spoiled that position because now Tan Zhang Yi is still in first place. She's a half point clear of Alexandra Goryachkina and Lachno would have tied for first. She would have been catapulted into first with Tan Zhang Yi and Goryachkina. That's a result that she is seriously going to regret as this candidate's tournament continues. Yes, and uh, Tan Zhong Yi could not suppress her delight at saving such a game. And I give all credit to her to find this result of just, just advancing the king's side pawns and to just snatch away 
def victory from Katarina Alagno at the last minute. What an escape for Tan Zhongyi. And uh, they're going back to the game between Anna Muzichuk and Lei Tongji. So not Lei Tongji, that's <laughs> not even a name. Lei Tingjie. It's, it's getting late. I think everyone- It is getting know, late. Can forgive the players for their mistakes in the games. I think that uh, for everyone watching, you know, kudos to you, you're doing great. Uh, but for Anna Musichuk, she's looking at this game and she's gonna keep playing, hoping for a win. But you know, internally, she is very upset with how this game has continued from what was a seemingly simple win in her mind, I'm sure, to get here. So for the second day in a row, she has unfortunately fumbled what was a winning position and they're not easy. The situations were not just a oh, go checkmate and one, but for a player of her caliber, she is on that quest per for perfection as all top players are. And I think that imperfection has uh, been striking at the wrong time. Yes. And do you think Anna not winning this game will be significant to her tournament? Because this is her second game in a row, which she has not found the winning move. And this one was even clearer than yesterday's game. Yes, I always want to be on the side of saying it's so early in this event. There are 10 rounds to go. You're going to play everyone twice so you can beat them in the second game. And that way you can catch up to people. But there's no way around it. Entering the first rest day with a minus score, one and a half out of four, that's going to hurt especially when there have been points left on the table. And to make matters worse than just her own result is the fact that Tan Zong Yi, she was able to draw that game, steal a half point, keep her lead in the tournament, and that's going to make it all the more painful. So as I look across the four boards, I think about each player's results. I think certain players are obviously going to be happy, namely Selimova. And I would also say Vaishali, drawing with the black pieces against Goryachkina. But I think there are going to be some players clearly going into the first rest day somewhat wounded from their recent results. Totally. And some players will be feeling very lucky, like Lei Tingjie and Tan Zhongyi. You feel like, like fortune has uh, favored you when you secure a draw like that. You really do. Uh, it's true. Yeah. You just feel like sometimes everything may go wrong and then you still don't lose. And then you can feel invincible. It can build your confidence. And for Tan Zhongyi, it was her first sort of foray into troubled waters. She was playing such great chess. And so to not only demonstrate that she can deliver some great technical wins like her end game in the a first round, and then that second game where she controlled all the dark squares and then went on the offensive against Vaishali, then to hold without pretty much any effort put in outside of her preparation. She played every move instantly. And then to survive today, she's doing it in all different ways. So I think that really builds her confidence heading into the first rest day. And for the other players, including these two, they're not going to be feeling so confident because they're at a minus score and they don't feel like they can convert their advantages when they have them. Yeah. Thing, the things will have to change for Anna Mistrick. She needs to shake things up, change the routine, do something a little bit different. And she does have the, tomorrow's rest day in order just to get over these missed wins. But here we do see a game rook against Knight. This is a draw. Shall we move over to the game between Salimova and Humpy Canaru? Because I'm curious to see whether there's any chance of uh, Humpy pulling off a miracle save in this one. The bar says no. I can see that it's all the way in White's favor. I say no as well. <laughs> Not because I'm rooting for any result, but because there's this bishop move to f5, then pawn to g6 with pawn to g7 coming up. Uh, the C4 pawn is actually not even important here. It's not about the quantity of your pawns at this stage, but the quality, and I would just rush that pawn forward. Yeah. It's a difficult ask, but there, there is some hope. If the knight can sacrifice itself for both of those pawns, 
It's a big ask, I admit that. So that's why there is only a little bit of hope, not a lot. Then technically this is a drawn endgame. And I'm just trying to figure out how you could even organize that because sometimes that happens and uh, players, they miss something, you get to grab those two pawns. And she goes bishop back to g2. So she may want to establish her bishop on d5, a protected square, and the black king may find itself in harm's way in addition to trying to fend off those past pawns. But Ivanka, I'm still trying to come up with that thought like where does the knight go to sacrifice itself e6 would be a pretty natural square but bishop's coming to d5 before you get there yeah it's not gonna happen let's face it <laughs> <laughs> it's just it was just a hope just a pipe dream and uh, i like this idea of just anchoring that bishop to d5 and then you can just step up with the king and just advance your pawn on g5 and is there something I, I'm trying to figure out where the pieces belong? How do I get this knight back in the game? But knights are short range pieces. They're slower movers than bishops. This bishop goes immediately towards the center and also takes away key squares from this black knight, which can't get back in time. And the plan, as you're saying, bring the king up, push the pawn, push it again. And then it's getting to the other side. I, I just, I'm not seeing anything in the way of preventing this very natural plan. No, not uh, seeing anything there either. Yeah, unfortunately for Black, somehow this, the most important squares of the board are on light squares. So there's just no way to kind of get that knight to e6, to get the knight to d7, where it can keep an eye on both of those pawns. It's just going to be broken down by this bishop. So only Salimova managed to get, or looks like she's going to get the win. Which is incredible considering what was happening after the opening. Like The opening was all dictated by Humpy and Salimova just responded move after move with purpose. She made sure to keep her king as safe as possible. She then was able to strike at the right moment. And that knight b5, that's the star move in a way because she prevented Humpy from casting queenside. It was your suggestion, a great find by you, and a great play by Salimova. And that was, I think, the key in a way to keep the black king unsafe so that Humpy couldn't go all in on the attack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was. I was very impressed by how Salimova managed to keep her composure the way, as you mentioned, she fanned off the attack. And then when it got sharp, she was in her element. She struck out with E4. She played the right preparatory moves. She found this beautiful idea of just advancing the king to F2, tucking it back to a starting square at the right time. And you also remember that both of these players were at some point on 30 seconds per move. And to do all of that with a cool head, well, fair play to Salimova but this is one of the biggest advantages of being the the lowest rated player is that everyone will want to beat you so they'll take unnecessary risks maybe from the opening choices so we saw Humpy play in a way that was pretty much out of her character she started off aggressively she took a lot of positional risks in a way that she doesn't normally do when she opens with the black pieces and one thing it will do for sure is it will put Salimova in a positive mood. She'll be on 50% and then she'll be fighting fit for round five. I just thought of something that I wasn't expecting to think about because when you consider the candidates, you almost assume everyone is a grandmaster. Can Salimova make a GM norm in the candidates? Is that, it must be possible, right? I think if you win, it's one of those events now. Okay. Don't quote me on this, but I suspect that if you win the candidates tournament, you get the GM title for sure. You know how that, there's some, there's some that, special that tournaments sense. like that, but I guess she can just earn a norm by her play because she's playing players from all different countries. Yes. It's a legitimate double yeah, round robin sure. tournament. So I, I actually wasn't initially thinking about that, but now that uh, I am, I'm like, well, she has so much to play for. Even she's in the running for first place. I'm not counting her out. No way. 
but I think she will always be motivated in this tournament because she has the norm to play for as well. Whereas for everybody else, it's first place and everything else is last place. So that's, I think, just an interesting storyline to add to the mix is that Salimova, she wants to win this. Do not count her out. She's a phenomenal player. She showed that at the World Cup where nobody expected her to finish at the top and qualify for the candidates. And while, while she's here beating a player like Humpy Canero, why not keep that, that going? There's no reason why she can't. And I think she's going to get her pawn ru- running shortly and that will end the game. I certainly think that, think that too. The king will also step up the board. G pawn will start motoring. The thing is, the position is so nice for Salimova that which pawn do you advance? Do you kind of go for the C, C pawn or do you just play it simple with the G pawn? They both look good. <laughs> yeah, too many choices. Uh, but I think the G pawn seems to be the most straightforward at this stage because the the best black can probably do is bring the rook around and check the white king a few times, but you may just walk the white king up to a place it wants to go. And she starts with the king move forward. I think that's, it doesn't change yeah. much because everything is winning at this stage. But I like that. I like that she leads with the king in the end game. I, I like that too. I th- the only try that I can see for Humpy is to do what you suggested, put the rook back on B1 and somehow get the knight to D3 to try to get to the E5 square. Okay, there there you go. Humpy's still fighting. Don't count her out. I won't, but I think I found the knockout while we're here, is that once this pawn's on G6, you are going to play rook F7 check because the king will not be able to step this way into the bishop's line of fire. So once the uh, check is leveled on F7, the king has to go to E8, and then you just push the pawn to G7, and now there is no stopping if we're getting to the other side. And if that happens, it's going to be game over. And it is quite an easy find as well, G6. Rick F7. Mm. It was a fight, Robert. It was a big fight this game. And it was very enjoyable to to watch how both players approach the opening, how it was this big battle between dynamism and strategical weaknesses. And very, very sharp, very crazy. And it was a pleasure to watch. Really, it, it was. And it, I think that my own personal preferences, they came out in full where I'm like, I like having my king very safe. When someone's opening an H file, that's scary for me. But the way that Salimova handled this game, very composed, a measured approach through and through, I'm very impressed with her because Humpy was forcing it from the opening. She eliminated her own right to castle, to the king side, pushed her king side pawns, went for the attack. And then when the attack didn't pan out, she was left with so many holes in her position and some breakthroughs available to white. So I, I think that Salamova played a model game uh, in this one, and it's really impressive. And she's showing that she's not just here to participate. She's not here by accident. She will land some heavy punches and take down some of the giants of the chess world. Yeah. And uh, now we've, we're coming up to the rest day. Whose form has impressed you the most? Because we saw Tan be incredibly impressive in his last three games, but today there were some weaknesses. We saw her in serious trouble against Katarina Lagno. Do you think this is worrying or do you think it's fine because she survived it, everything's good? The survival is the most important point for sure. And it's not like she played a terrible game. She didn't blunder anything horribly like a piece, but she did lose her way at some point. And I think clock management played a part and credit to Katarina Locke. No, she posed so many problems and played at a quick pace. But I would say that in addition to Tan Zhang Yi, I've been, I'm impressed by Nurgil Salimova right now, but I would say Vaishali drawing this game with black and she wasn't really under huge pressure against Goryachkina after beating Salimova the round before. You can see this is a different version of Vaishali than we saw out of the gates where she might have been a bit nervous. So I think that these players who are in their first candidates tournament, 
they're showing that they're the real deal and they are going to play a massive role in determining who comes out on top. Totally. And it's so important psychologically to get that first victory because as you say, you know, Vaishali it helped us so much defeating Salimova because she was able to just use that to just improve her confidence. And now we do see in the board, the king drops back to e5, but your plan of just simply going rook to f7 check, still very much in play. And I saw well, this Humpy big threat of the... e7. Yeah, but did you see they both had to grab the new score sheets? I often, as a player, would just resign so I didn't have to start a whole new one and write more moves down. <laughs> I, I'm guilty of that one as well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it doesn't doesn't make so much sense, right, to carry on the game because white has a big threat of g7 check. And then you're just simply going to promote the pawn. So you have to go rook to g1. Or if you go knight to d3, king to d4, just attacks the knight and you still got the idea of g7. So that's going to be game over. And after rook to g1, then you've got your idea of just going rook to f7, g7. It's the done deal. And it is the done deal. Okay, so now we rook to g1. I just found a nice game ending tactic if she wants. She went rook f7 check, so my first idea, but king d6 was clever and winning, and there are the handshakes. So the game is in the books. Yvanka, Nergil Salamova, she impressed me, and I think she impressed many with that win over Humpy Canero. She certainly did. Her composure throughout the game, even with seconds left on her clocks at time, it was most impressive. And Salimova gets that much needed comeback win after yesterday's defeat against Vaishali. So Salimova moves on to 50%, and that means that one game is still remaining. And that is between Anna Muzichuk and Lei Tingjie. We left it at a draw <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and it still remains a draw, but uh, Anna is trying. Now the secret to, tr well, getting winning attempts in this is somehow if you manage to separate the connection between the king and the knight, if you're able to get enough distance between them, you can actually just sideline the knight. Unfortunately, in this particular situation, as long as Lei Tingjie keeps her knight close to the king, she is going to be doing fine. And that's the key. So bringing the knight back with check would be the move I would opt for. If the king goes in opposition, bring the knight back once again. Just keep the king and knight together, as you are suggesting, and there should not be a danger. That's the problem with this particular ending, is that the plan is so straightforward and Lei Tingji does it, but there's no way around it. Rook and bishop versus rook, for example, that's a theoretically drawn position from the start, but so tricky and you have to know things. Here, the key is keeping king and knight together. And I think there's not really much more to know than that, Yamaka. Yeah, and oh, there we do see the players agree a draw, shake hands. And it is a lucky escape, a miracle escape for Lei Tingjie and for Anna Muzichuk. Once again, victory evades her. But having said all that, Anna Muzichuk did play such a fantastic game. She was playing such courageous moves at points. She found some impressive resources. It just feels heartbreaking that she wasn't able at the last minute to secure that much needed victory she's one of the players where you look at the standings the, in the table of results she deserves more she's played better than her score would indicate but she has not been able to convert and that's credit to her opponents for putting up resistance but also maybe a sign that her loss in the second round, it might have done more damage than initially meets the eye. And as we see the results, Ivanka, only one decisive game when it looked like we might get three. 
it did look like that at one point but as you can see it was Sally Mova just 20 years old who beat Humpy Canaru all the other games did finish in a draw but everyone put us through their paces we had everything we had fireworks on the board we had miracle escapes we had precision attacks what a day of chess it was a great day and even though some players won't agree with that statement i think all the fans of chess can because the players are giving it their all even the quick draw relatively compared to the time it took for the other games between goryachkina and vaishali that was anything but some kind of boring draw they were just maneuvering around and when players play optimally and super accurate chess good luck beating them so every game had something to take away from it and for a few players, what they're going to take away is disappointment because they didn't convert their winning advantages. It uh, certainly will be disappointing for some of the players. Others will be smiling in relief. And here, after four rounds, we do have the standings. After that Herculean effort there from Tan Zhong Yi, she managed to escape with a draw against um, Katerina Lagno. In second place, we have Alexandra Goryachkina. But here are the pairings for round five, which will take place in on Tuesday. Because remember, tomorrow it is a free day. And here are the matchups. Leighton J plays Katerina Lagno. Vaishali faces off against Anna Mozichuk. Hampi Kaneru against Alexandra Goryachkina. And Tan Zhong Yi, she will play Salimova. Robert, which one of those matches excites you the most? Well, our tournament leader is Tan Zhang Yi, so I think that I have to appreciate that matchup. They've never played each other in classical chess, so Nergil Selimova, will she be heading into that game on a high after her win today? She's the black pieces, and against such a strong player, I think for Tan Zhang Yi, if she can win that and separate herself from some of the field, that would be huge. What about you, Yvanka? Which of these games catches your eye most? I'm very curious to see how Vaishali continues her tournament and whether the rest day will rejuvenate Anna and she'll come back in fighting shape and be able to secure that much needed win. But I suspect that we will be seeing a decisive result and we'll be seeing a lot more of thrilling action as we've come to expect every day. What a day it's been, Robert. <laughs> it's, it's really put us through the paces. And there we can see the standings. Once again, Tan Zhong Yi, she did get that much hoped for draw. Three points out of four. Alexander Gryashkina still in second place with two and a half points out of four. And Katerina Lagno, Vishali, and now Salimova. They've all moved on to 50%. Oh. It had so many twists and turns. I did not expect today to finish the way it did. One decisive game, especially when it looked like we were in for a treat with three decisive results. I thought we were going to get those three, but instead we get one. And quick question for you, Yvonka. I know it's late. The round has extended quite deep into the night uh, for us here, but... My question is, of the players who share the bottom of the standings, who have one and a half out of four, who do you expect is most likely to make a run and try to catch up to the tournament leaders? Well, I suspect Lei Ting Jie. I, I, she's started off with that loss against Tan Zhong Yi, but since then, you know, she's drawn all her games, and today's lucky escape will give will feel like a victory for her because she really should have been she should have lost so i suspect that she is going to be the one that comes back on round five she will be there with renewed vigor and she's a tough tough opponent she is clearly a tough opponent played for a world championship was so close in that one and i think that's a good choice because in a weird way players who are playing maybe worse than some of the other competitors, but still getting results, at least positive ones, that can actually be good for them going forward once they get that rest day in. Like if I'm drawing games where I'm in trouble, maybe I can just you know, find my rhythm, find my form. And then the other players who are not converting their advantages, they may feel that pressure to win games. And once you start playing for results, you lose your objectivity, and then you're not really playing the objective game of chess. So this is a struggle when it's first or bust, as is the candidates. It uh, certainly will be the issue. 
because when we come back on Tuesday, remember tomorrow, it is a rest day. We will find out who is rested and rejuvenated, re-energized, and who will be feeling the pressure. That's a one thing that we can all look forward to. Robert, it's been an absolute privilege and pleasure to commentate alongside of you. It's made, you've made the games a lot of fun and exciting to watch. I, I think the players make it fun and you make it all the more enjoyable. So Ivanka, I should be thanking you. The pleasure was all mine. And I want to thank everybody who is, you know, been sticking around, hanging out with us and watching all of these amazing women compete because without them, this event doesn't happen. And I'm always appreciative to get on the call and cover these games because even though I haven't been here in previous days, I have followed very closely and been super impressed with the level of play, especially when, as we've been saying, there are so many nerves attached to this tournament. Totally. Thank you all for watching and see you all on next Tuesday.